Recording is on. Well, greetings, everybody, around the world, and it's uh, Sunday, January the 16th, and this is the Eastern Extinction RT meeting, and we've got quite a full agenda, so let's uh, let's kick off. So, um, I think the first thing on the agenda is Kings North again. <laughs> is, is, am I right? <laughs> oh. Well, yeah, I, I didn't know whether we kind of worn it out or whether whether you were happy to, to oh. talk a bit more about it. Oh, no, no, I, I, I got to tell you this. Bit. <laughs> so we had a little, recently we've had a little synchronicity with Daddy Watts. <laughs> what, and, what, with uh, Kings that's... North? Well, yeah, did you see the, okay, so where yep. that... Yeah, I saw the ferry boat video. I've seen that yeah, before. So I'll tell you why I put that up there. So, okay, so okay. Uh, the um, Torsten put this thing up from Sam, Sam Mitchell, right? Did you see that? No, I haven't. I forgot to follow Sam up, but go ahead. Ah, okay, okay. So then <laughs> you're going to enjoy the story. Um, yeah. So Sam... Uh, you know, I had this. Did what? Well, did you see the King's North? Um, I can't say the V word, but the the V moment um, essay he did. No, I saw that he, that Sam had done a video on King's North, but I didn't watch it. Um, oh, okay. So, so I, I don't so, know that's part of the story. All, all I did was I did send Sam a copy of uh, somebody's manifesto, um, and then I realised yeah. I had to. I should, so that's a, that might be a separate affair. I don't know. I, I don't know. Oh uh, yeah, no, it is. So okay, so so King King North um, put out this kind of uh, screed um, about his V moment, where he he's like you know. He oh, the three the, the three essays. Yeah. yeah. The, what? Yeah. The, 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 he the wants three, the whole it's a three part. Stop in his track because he's just seen yeah. the machine. Just, the just hit, seen the light. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, and so, yeah. And so now, now he wants the angels to sing, and he wants rose petals at his feet. And then he, anyway, Sam Mitchell did did the deed for him, and uh, so Sam gets into this in big time and says, "You know, this is the best thing I've ever read in my life." And and anyway, he gets to the end. And then he blows me away because he he finally did what we've been waiting for him to do for freaking years, and that's he he came out with what he his trip was always in case. Does everybody know who Sam Mitchell is? By the way, just yeah, um, I'm probably the only one who knows him really well. But I don't know, Torstein does. Oh, well, anyway, we okay. Know. So Sam Mitchell is is like one of the leading lights or black lights of the Doomosphere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, his whole shtick has been ecology and everything, everything but religion. <laughs> but, you know, we all knew that it was underneath it all. It's all about religion, you know. And so, well, not religion, but uh, more spirituality. Right? But he never fessed up. He always done Doomerism, right? So now in this video... He faces up <laughs> and he says, and he says at the end, he says, you know, I've never, maybe I haven't mentioned it to my tribe before, but, um, you know, if ever I've had a guru, it's been um, the sky, <laughs> Alan Watts. <laughs> and so this is exactly what I was telling you, why I'm getting so worked up about Kings North. Kings North is evil he's poison he's he's basically he's the devil's child whether he knows it or not because 
Kings, he 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 fell into the Kings North honey trap, but Sam Mitchell fell straight into the trap. So so basically, the whole thing about the the V moment um, essay, it all comes down in the end to, and therefore, I'm over to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so that's it's just you know follow me the siren call to basically the kool-aid way so it's like uh so and it worked on sam it drew sam out and sam is off to his own religion i mean oh, oh, was, was sam's <laughs> not gonna go for christianity right but but he's going for you know spirituality alan white style his, his own religion so it's, I didn't see that when when he finished. But I, mean, I know he read it. He read a good part of the the vaccine moment. Uh, he didn't read it all, but I didn't feel he was following. I think he was admiring the writer. Maybe it's my reading no, of no, that. No, he did that. He did that. But you see, what, what he's going to do now is going to change his path. You see, <laughs> he basically said it. You see, we we've, we've been waiting for Sam to come out with all his his real stick which is spirituality he just never would do it now for the first time he outed himself and what his motivation was which is which is unwise. but it was king's north's essay that got him to do it you see. So the, um, the, he he did do it once because i listened to him from uh Fairly well at the big when he first started Collapse Chronicles from soon after that first started, mm. uh, and that became popular. It it only became um, he, Sam only became established because at that time uh, he knew Guy McPherson and they were getting along very well. And Guy uh, helps publicise Sam's channel when it was starting up, um, and that's how Sam's that's how Collapse Chronicles ended up being a fairly well-known thing, although Sam and McPherson broke up catastrophically later on for fairly well all the same reasons why everybody else did, um, you know, and the same things that you discovered too. I think you were talking about that last week. Um, but, yeah, there was one occasion. Uh, it was the, the interview he did with Guy Lane. Um, Sam did one interview, and in that interview, Sam revealed his spiritual uh, leanings there. It's the only time I ever heard him do it until now, until you until you're just talking now. So the he, he has the only thing he has done consistently in the in between time is uh, he he was very, very deeply impressed with um, the Don Quixote story. You, you know, the uh, the whole um, uh, you know like metaphysical the, the whole thing behind that story and he very often referred to that um he's i can't remember that he's ever referred to alan watts in in any of the you know and i listened to a fucking lot of his talks until you came along no, and no, sort of no. said, this is the first yeah. time this is the first yeah, time but, he, but he really yeah but what i was going himself. to say was amongst the people who follow him and, and the regular commenters on his Collapse Chronicles, there's, there's quite, a, uh, quite a few references made to Alan Watts. And uh, for quite a while when I was frequenting that, that channel, um, you know, I, I would put... Uh, in fact, there was another fellow there, another couple of fellows there, and we, we played a little game. Somebody would put a little quote up and then somebody else would say, oh, yeah, I know who that is. And, and we would all recognise the quotes as being from, from Alan Watts. And it was, it was a little bit of a game going on there for a while. But Sam never entered into that. He, he never, during that time, he never gave any inclination that he was affected by Watts one way or the other. Um, so if, uh, what you're saying now is, is news to me, you know, as someone who, oh, yeah, who I mean, had I a lot of... I he's the um, he's going to launch in a new direction on a mission. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, so that's very interesting. Sam but what's from it, now on. Yeah, but I mean, Alan Watts, if he listens to Alan Watts, he's not going to be able to uh, set Watts up as a, as a big daddy in the sky or anything. He's going to be, you know. Um, okay, yeah, well, this is, this is what we must talk about because, the, so, you know, basically the ghost of Alan Watts <laughs> hangs around us quite a bit too. Um, uh, so, yeah, especially on Friday. Um, 
so yeah, I, no, I just feel like I I better explain what I what what my thing is about about Kings North. <laughs> So Alan Watts, you can be misinterpreted, and a lot of people do, and they do, you know, you've got to be careful with uh, with these luminaries, because if you just follow their work and stuff and you, you don't see them in person, you can interpret Alan Watts as Kool-Aid, right? So just so just so everybody has a level set. The Extinction Art is not about taking Kool-Aid in the jungle. Most of these cults are about Kool-Aid in the jungle, right? Kings North is... He, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not a very smart guy, but he's like he he's on the path to Kool Aid in the jungle, whether he knows it or not. See, this is this is the problem with with these. You know, we're heading into like the end time. Hang on, hang on. Well, I'm confused already. We, we, we might have to go a little bit more slowly because you, you've you've already uh, um, acknowledged King's North's intelligence and that he should know better but now you're saying that he's not a very smart but smart guy so can we just get this into a bit of context okay so like look at um this is where having a little bit of knowledge is dangerous especially if you start spreading it around and you start being a guru when you're too green to do it which is what he's doing but if you have a look at the very first thing in his essay for example i'll take this for an example he, he has this little vignette about Dostoevsky, and he says, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really have a place, that kind of thing, except he's trying to set him himself up as a storyteller, and he's, you know, King's North. And, he's, and so he's saying, Dostoevsky said there are only two stories. In, in effect, there's, you know, somebody leaves on a long journey from the village, or otherwise a stranger arrives in town. You know, those are, Dostoevsky said, in essence, those are the only two stories there are, right? And then King's North has a very interesting adjunct to that. And he says he never noticed until a student of his pointed it out that these were two sides of the same coin. And I was like, oh, my fuck. I think like, because Dostoevsky wrote it knowing that you, you know, that you saw that it was two sides of the same coin. It's like you shouldn't be reading Dostoevsky. As it, it means that he's reading Dostoevsky at a level that isn't there. <laughs> so, you know, it means that King Wolf read this and went, oh, yeah, that's interesting. I got that fact that it's about, uh, you know, uh, somebody leaves town on a long journey. Got it. And somebody, and he's reading it so literally. What See, what Dostoevsky is saying in that sentence is that it's all about change and movement. Okay, so basically that's how some, you know, some of the essence of the story is evolution and change and movement seen from two sides. So Dostoevsky is saying you mirror here, mirror there. So that what you see, what one side sees going, the other side sees coming. That's what the sentence is fucking about. I, I was just appalled that he didn't, <laughs> didn't know what it was. So saying like, you can't read Dostoevsky and start quoting luminaries and that if, you, if, if your inside is that low. So, okay, so... So the you see, King's North, ha, he on the ten bulls, right? He hasn't got to panel number three where he's seen the bull. He's just seen the bull's tail. He's on panel number two, right? The bull's tail is the you know he's seen the machine, right? So great. Now he wants the whole world to stop because you know little goody two shoes, you know, master of the establishment and stuff. He, he's now seen that the machine is evil. Oh, great. Well, you're like, you know, thousands of years too late. But anyway, okay, welcome to the party. Now, now let's all, you know, slit our wrists for this. But okay, so now, so the what he hasn't seen is, uh, okay, now what is dangerous is that he hasn't seen that this machine is Janus headed. Right? It's a good cop, bad cop combo. It's, a, you know, Anarchists say it's like no gods, no masters. It's church and state. It, this, the, it's the good cop and the bad cop work in tandem. And so he's seen the bad cop and he goes running to the good cop, which is orthodox religion. You see, the, the, you see okay, let, I, maybe I didn't get this point across properly in the last thing where I said about Auschwitz. When you arrive in Auschwitz, you arrive in a death camp. And then there are two paths. There's a guy with a table. You walk up to the table and he sorts you left and right. If you go to the left, you go towards this door, which is painted with flowers and it has you know, a star of David and a cross on it. And it looks lovely. It looks like the play center. And if you look on the right, 
the guys lined up in a workforce with capos with sticks, and it looks very evil. So King's North has seen that if you go to the right, the machine is evil. And so he's just seen that. And he's saying, oh, that looks bad. He's saying, like, I'm going to the left. That's the gas chambers, dude. So basically, if and how he ends that essay is he doesn't say, he says, briefly, we must, you know, fight against the machine. But then he, he, he says, we must reject the machine. Not we must fight it or we must resist it or anything. We must reject it. See, this is, these guys are not survivors, right? They are, we are going through an ordeal of the ages. These guys are mincemeat in the first obstacle. Because may I say like, something? May, may I yeah. say, add something to what you're saying? I don't want to interrupt you too long because you were on a thread there. But that's exactly what I wanted to discuss with Paul when I invited him, is the machine. Because I was very interested to see um, that he could see it. Uh, but I was very interesting, interested to see, could he see that it was inside us too? Could he see the mirror in him? And and I think that's where he stayed outside of of himself. He stayed, he, he took, as you say, the path of, you know, yeah, good against the machine, not rage against the machine, you know, he, and good, good as, you know, Christian. And uh, that's really why I wanted to talk to him and to engage on, on, on the thing. So there you go. Well, you, you preempted exactly where I was going. I and mean, he hasn't seen that the machine is inside us. He, he, he can see the machine outside. And now he's chosen one arm of the machine, which is religion. It's death. So, so and I mean it literally, right? The, the, these intellectuals have glass jaws. The first, re, you know, it's all an intellectual exercise for him now. But I'm telling you, I'm telling everybody that listens to this, this is going to get real. This is not an academic exercise. It, like, if Paul Kingsnorth is listening to this, I'm telling you, Paul, stop writing. It's You're just delaying yourself. This writing process where you write these illuminated manuscripts on all your half-illuminated ideas is holding you back. You've got to move faster, right? The, this, this is too slow, this process that you're going through. The best thing he could do is to stop writing and start moving faster. Because what he needs to see is that, like, this machine is inside us. The devil is inside us and very close. It's here, just here, six millimeters thick on the left side, right? The demon is in us. And just the mere fact that he said, you know, he, he accused us of not being internally ordered. That's the voice of the machine. We're fucking primates. What fucking thing is internally ordered? Life is not internally ordered. That mere statement means he he is an agent of the machine. The demon has him by the balls, and he, he doesn't know it. So, so he needs to progress. And while he writes illuminated manuscripts, gets narcissistic reflection from other people like Sam, this is all going towards Kool-Aid. And what I mean by Kool-Aid does mean so at some point, this gets real. At some point, you get a knock on the door in the night, and then you get a trial. He will not make it through if Jesus and he's relying on his buddy and his imaginary friend in the sky. But those guys go down. Okay, now, okay, go back to the example of we arrive in Auschwitz. This planet is freaking Auschwitz, right? So if Paul King's North is going to step to the table and say, I, I've seen that this is Auschwitz. Oh, brilliant. You know, welcome to the club. You saw that you're in Auschwitz. What do you want? A gold medal now? So we're in Auschwitz. Great. Welcome aboard, Paul. So now he steps towards the the, the table, and he's a goodie, two-shoes, two obedient servant of the system, and he's going to say to the guy on the desk, well, I'm refusing this. I'm not fighting it. I'm not getting around it. I'm not working the system. I'm refusing it. You know what the guy on the desk is going to say? He say like he says like I refuse. I'm not going over to your labor camp on the right. I want to go to the left. And the guy on the desk is going to say, "Go for it, asshole." <laughs> Cuz he knows that the gas chamber. Okay, if you're a survivor and the extinction idea is all about survival, right? Survivors go to the right. 
it's hard, it's dangerous, you know that this is not going to be good, but you have a chance, you have an option on the right. If you go to the labor camp, you can forestall the inevitable. You, you know, maybe the camp gets liberated, maybe the allies come, maybe you live through the experience, but you go for the hard and the evil thing. You don't go towards the flowery, nice thing. That's the, you know, the face of the good cop. That's the syrupy, you know, that's the honey trap. Don't go there. So, okay, a, an advanced extinctionati in that situation is you try and break out of the herd. You try and hide under the train, perhaps, or, you know, stay in the boxcar. Or, you know, maybe the train pulls out at night and you could get out of the camp. But you always want to basically, you don't want to go and make a big stand and, you know, you're going to get chopped down. You want to work this, you want to bring down Auschwitz, but not with, not this way, not by doing these moral stands and, you know, all, all this showboating and narcissism. You're going to get taken down. You just can't do it now. So anyway, I, this is what I'm saying. But he'll lead people there. He, he is capable. He is just clever enough and just enough of a sophist and a good enough storyteller and writer to garner a good number of people, maybe a hundred people or so he could get in, in his, on his ethos. And those guys are all going to go the same way. Is this what uh, Bull Hansen is doing too, where he gets up there and says, you know, I refuse, and, and he's got another video that's titled, I refuse and I will not, and blah, blah, blah. Is, that a, is he doing a similar process? from your point of view there where he's he's yeah. just you know he won't go along but uh on the other side of it uh yeah they, 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 but they, yeah this is a this is a dance right so the, the you know you you don't you you don't stand up against the machine you know they're basically this is two evenly opposed forces just assume right so you dance with the machine it's Whoever breaks, breaks like, uh, you know, a paperclip that's being bent back and forth and back and forth. It's a trial of us and the machine. But, you you know, you don't stand up against the machine and just go bang and, you know, we like, like Faulty wants to do, that everybody stands up in moral outrage and ends the machine. It's like, that doesn't work. For starters, the machine's inside you. So when you... When you've overtaken the government and stuff, now you're the fucking machine. Now what? So it doesn't freaking work. The whole exercise is that the two battle it out in this, you know, trial against each other. But it's a dance, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. If you're too rigid, you'll break. You have to learn to bend, to go this way, to go that way. And basically, you exhaust the other side slowly. But it's a trial to exhaust you. Right. That's, I, that's, think this is, that's I think this is fascinating because at the moment, especially in the COVIDian situation, I think there's more and more writers and, and YouTubers and all that who are seeing the machine, much more than they were two or three years ago. So they're all at this uh, stage of the bull that you were mentioning. And a lot of people are following the same path as um, Paul Kiggs North with different different uh, options. Uh, for example, I'm just exploring C.J. Hopkins that Petra pointed to me and I'm starting to read his stuff and listen to some of his videos. And he's on a, well, he's, it's, I'm just only on the path of understanding where he's going. So, but he's got a very good analysis, but he does say, you don't fight against the machine. He says, like, you know, he does say this is like, he compares, he was talking about the, the capital uh, storming in January last year and saying, it wasn't that totally ridiculous to see a group of people hardly armed trying to stand up against the immense power of the American uh, police and army, you know, but that was just an image he was taking, but taken. But I think to come back to what you're saying, there's more and more people who are seeing the machine, and that's where we need to to continue to to to, to spread for to spread to explain what we see as extinctionati, um, this beast inside ourselves, this kind of this. this yeah. I think a lot of people don't see that, and that's that's why the yeah. the, the dialogue are sterile. Really, at one stage, we all get back to the same thing. You know, let's get up in arms. Let's destroy it. Let's. Let's fight against the machine, and it's yeah. 
What do you propose for that? Well, I mean, so, okay, just to recap on what you said, there, is, is what, what you're saying, in, in other words, is everybody is a panel two of the 10 bull sequence. They've seen the tail of the bull, right? So, so our job is done on, on yeah, this, uh, you know, the Joe Rogan, everybody, Russell Brand, all of these guys, they, Russell Brand and stuff is better because he, he's more self-aware than Kings North. Right? So, so uh, uh, Russell Brand is quite an enlightened guy. And uh, Russell Brand is quite, uh, you know, au fait with the idea, okay, let's put him on panel three, that he, he's seen the bull, right? He knows that the bull is inside us. He's, but, I mean, that that is a big sticking point. So the, from panel three to panel four, you know, the, the way I was taught this was, in my cup was that it's an octave progression. Now, there's a semitone. There's a, a kind of a disjunct between, you know, do, do, re, mi. That mi is very egotistical, right? It's, it's, it's also um, quite stable. You know, it's, it's, to, it's, it's, you're kind of stuck. A lot of people are stuck on me. You see, Freud was stuck on me. You know, they, a lot of people, spiritual people will tell you Freud never made it past the third chakra. It's another way of saying it. But everybody knows that there needs to be a change of gear around about um, that transition from like to me far, you know, so it's do re mi fa. The far is uncertain. It's a bit rickety. It's it's a new era, but that is in a, essentially, in a, essentially enlightenment. But the, you you can't get from me to far with an effort of will, right? You can't, you can't, it's not up to the individual. It's just an external shock or they often say grace or something. There is a kind of gotcha because, you know, grace won't descend on you without a lot of work. It's kind of like, you know, Gary Player was a South African golfer, a good South African golfer. And he, I, I saw, uh, he had a lesson with him once and he, he said, basically, he said, look, the secret about golf is it's just luck. That's you know, he's he was at the time he was the best golfer in the world and and so everybody was shocked. They said, "What? Well, come on! You you telling telling me that you know your whole career has just been luck?" He said, "Yeah, pure luck." He said, "But there is one thing you need to know: the more you practice, the luckier you'll get." <laughs> and that is a good bit of advice, right? There. Because especially for the spiritual path, is you cannot get there by the mind because. It's it, it, because it's contradictory. It's all about liberation from the ego. So the ego wants to acquire spirit, spirituality. It wants to attain it <laughs> without realizing that the road there is to get rid of that very piece that wants to attain it in you, that module in you that wants to grab and grasp. <laughs> it's the getting rid of that module that gets you there. But, you know, it takes people a while to get there. So and 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 good instruction, which is not really available <laughs> in, these, in these times. But in these times, these are times of trial, and they're going to be false gurus everywhere. So people with a little knowledge that's overextended, and this is the pro the problem is, is uh, they won't survive the first bullets of this, <laughs> figuratively and literally, right? So so that dark night. Right? So when you're in these situations of collapse and stuff. You see it coming. You know that you, you, you first you see it on the news. It's very abstract. It's coming, you know, war and the distant rumble of war. Who said that? It's some classic thing. And then basically it comes closer. And maybe it's in the Bible. But anyway, you, you hear the what we're hearing now is war and the dis, distant rumble of war. You can read in the news, you know, trouble abroad, brewing, and, you know, this dinner table talk about, you know, how. Flanders was invaded sort of thing. And then, but what happens is that comes closer and closer. You see, you see it start to visit you. You start to hear personally that somebody came down in this, you know, all of this happened. So, and then, you know, you, and then people start in chronic denial. They start all their, their, their little rabbit's foots and Ouija's of how they're going to protect it. In South Africa, males, because they had too much testosterone and they'd go and get a gun. And then you say, like, I'm I'm not going down like this. Hol you know, everybody has a gun in the holster here. That, like, so that was their little magic foot. I'll tell you, I'm only, a, I'm only alive today because I didn't carry a gun. 
right? I was one of the few, few people in uh, males in South Africa that didn't carry a gun and it saved my life. But anyway, I'm just, I'm just saying that they, people start going for these things that are lethal, that they think they're good. The statistics in South Africa said that, um, you know, people that own guns, that the, if the gun was discharged, there was a 60% chance that it was discharged to its owner, right? So all these guys were getting guns for protection, not knowing that the most likely person, the gun, their own guns were going to be used on is themselves, either because the attacker gets hold of them or otherwise because they commit suicide. This is where the, this is where the Kool-Aid, see, the, the Christians and the religious guys and the spiritual guys, they, they are weak. They're morally weak. Um, they're intellectually weak and they, uh, they're spiritually weak. You know, anybody that goes for, you know, the, Santa Claus or imaginary friend in the sky is a spiritual coward. Right? They're spiritual and intellectual coward. They're weak, and where and they go for suicide. Right. So so when when the bad shit happens, if they have a gun, they turned it on themselves. So this is not the path to survival. What I'm trying to teach you is survival skills. The extinction nadi is about survival. Okay. So just underline that. You know. But you have to go through the same valley of the shadow of death that everybody has to go through. The trick is to survive it. But the, at, there's a pot of Kool-Aid right on the left-hand side, and you can take it at any time. Right? So I, maybe some of the things I've been telling you over the years are coming together. Everything I've told you has a meaning. Right? I told you about how officer training works. Right? I didn't tell you that because I was like, and on an ego trip or something, it's like it, all these things like offer tr officer training is an ordeal, right? So it's, and that's the same kind of thing. It's a trial by fire. And I'm, I told you the secret. Does everybody remember the secret to getting? So, yeah, I got through and then another guy, and you remember that, that we were voted the least likely to get through at the start of officer training. Yeah, that was in our Darwin video, right? I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the guys who are the generalists make it through. Yeah, but yeah, do they, so it's a big filter. And so, so this is what people misunderstand. And maybe Kings North has put, put them in this category. Is people think that you get through the filter with virtue, right? So they think it's uh, some quality you've got, something you have that gets you through the game. No. Nature doesn't work that way. I, I did the Darwin videos. I explained to you how evolution, evolution works with the three Fs, right? It's like focal points of attraction and repulsion. Okay, so like go back to Dostoevsky, right? That what he's saying there is the first part of evolution. A story is an evolution. So it's like what Dostoevsky is saying there is, is when somebody leaves, that's basically a repulsion. And then a stranger arrives in a village is the attractor. So he's, he's saying the first part of the F, of focal points of attraction and repulsion. The, the, and he should have gone on and said that, well, there's another part to storytelling, and that's feedback. Because a story only works if you, if you have feedback, right? I mean, if the guy, say, arrives in the village, it, it doesn't work unless there's feedback to where he came from or some kind of close. I mean, if you have the movie like E.T., so there's no story if E.T. is like a, is the version of a stranger arrives in town. So then, you know, E.T. arrives in California and, well, he looks weird, but he settles in and becomes Californian. Is that a story? No. It's got to be E.T. wants to go home. It's the feedback and the whole, you know, so this feedback is the next element. And then the, the last one is filtration. It's basically, and you, you feel, it, this is, Kings North obviously knows this because he said it in his screed that he, he knows the difference between a good story and one that holds together and one that doesn't. And then basically that's the filter. So he's, yeah, uh, that, so that's exactly what nature is doing. But how does the filter work? It doesn't filter for quality. This is why Darwin was wrong. That's, that would be against the, the, the second law of the thermodynamics. So Darwin thought 
that you could filter for quality and quality would keep on growing. That's retarded. That's unscientific. Look, it works like sound in a sound system. If you have a high fidelity sound system, there's not some module in the sound system that adds good sound to the sound. It just has a high pass filter and a low pass filter, and it filters out noise. But if you, you can't get to a superior signal that was not in the original uh, transmission. So the, all the filter will do will get the, the transmission to be as good as the signal was. But it can't add to that signal. It doesn't know how. Where would it get? You know, if you're doing Mozart, if you're playing Mozart on your hi-fi, the electronics doesn't know how to do Mozart. So all it can do is filter out the noise and give you high fidelity Mozart. It can't add to Mozart. So this is the same. If you do officer training and you go through an ordeal like this, it's just a high pass filter and a, and a low pass filter, right? So everybody thinks, you know, they've got this fabulous attribute. You know, I've got laser eyes and I've got huge muscles and I've got superior intellect. Oh, they love the intellect, especially the pseudo intellectuals. All oh, in intellect's going to get us through. It's like, no, intellect's a, a deficit. So it's like, so anyway, I'm just saying that these filter processes are just to see have you got any rough edges? And basically, if you haven't, so the, the reason why I got through and this other guy got through is we didn't have anything going for us, but we didn't have anything seriously bad against us, which was the far more important thing, right? We, well, we got through everything reasonably well. And so we just, people couldn't understand how we lasted so long. It's like, you know, we just, but you're just average. You say, yeah. That's what they're trying to do. They don't make officers out of superheroes. They're not, not looking for superheroes to make you an officer. They're making for somebody that won't fuck up. <laughs> so they're just trying to take out people who have flaws. And every single one of these guys, you know, for every, every kind of attribute you have, like, oh, huge intellect, you've got a deficit. Most people that have a huge intellect are not very athletic. Right? So, you know, if you have, a, if you have, um, you know, you've got some, uh, you know, if you have a huge intellect, then people will hate you. So, so part of this thing, in officer training, you had buddy rating. It was just like these, you know, kick people off the island thing, so that your buddies would rate you too. They would take that into account. So, if, uh, if you had some great attribute, like you were a genius and you know, stuck-up narcissist like Kings North, Kings North would never have made it through officer training. Not fucking a day. Because, because people would hate him. He's such a stuck-up prig. So basically, they, they would eliminate him on the buddy school. They would say, like, fucking kids. They, would, you know, they might be nice to him in his face, but when they get to mark you in the back room, they'd fucking yeah, take their revenge on you. So I also told you about... Um, on, oh, I, I did this in... I, I told you this about school. Okay, so, so here's another story from school. When, when, uh, when I was at school, we, we had to do these, at the end of the year, we had to do um, route marches, basically. They're camps. They were called camps. But you go for a week, and you go trekking through the bush and stuff, and it's like you either love it or you hate it. But it's training for the military, right, is what they're really doing. It's just early training for, for the military. And it's, you do exactly the same kind of route marches when you go on these things. But anyway, they are exactly these kind of trials and set you against your buddies and that kind of thing. And what what people, what we did to each other as boys, it was just a known meme, is that, you know, a lot of these things, when things get tough, it brings out the arsehole in people. And what people do to you there is they start surreptitiously putting rocks in your pack. <laughs> so, so, if you, so as you go, if you're an arsehole, things don't go well for you. And you don't know why. It's just you, you arrive everywhere late in more of a sweat. You every expending more energy. Everything's going. And the guy is putting rocks in your pack. Eventually, you, you undo your pack and you'll find a rock in it. And you'll know how many rocks is how many people hate you. But anyway, we did the same thing in the army. So so basically, if you this is how it works in tribal societies and stuff, is nobody confronts you and says, you know, well, they might, but but, but anyway. The, the best instruction of all is if 
they anonymously put a rock in your, in your thing. And so if you're whiny, if you're whiny shit, basically the, the army will teach you and the, and the schooling, the old English school system will teach you not to be a whiny shit because nobody likes a little whiny shit and they will put rocks in your pack. <laughs> your life will get more and more difficult the more you whine. So this is all good training, which nobody does anymore, but I'm trying to, Give it to you <laughs> second hand. Okay, so so anyway, this is this is why I say what I'm to, to just sum up is is these guys will not survive, right? So if if it's it's like a guy, you know, this kind of spirituality, this orthodox spirituality, and by the way, the um, the Romanian Orthodox Church is fascist, right? So this 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 you know this is wrong anyway. So you you go have a look at the the Romanian Orthodox Church in its background. They're freaking Nazis, right? So King's North here, yeah, the left wing guy who's gone over to the fucking Nazis. <laughs> so, so this is fucked up, just any way you look at it. But anyway, the the you must look at those kind of um, you know belief in the you know Santa Claus and the imaginary friend in the sky and that is. It, these guys are alcoholics, so they've got as much chance of making it through this ordeal as a guy that, you know, starts out on the Oregon Trail with a bottle of whiskey or goes into military training with, you know, with an alcohol addiction. You're not going to make it, right? You've got to clean yourself up, and that means getting the religion out of your head. Anyway, so talking about, Sophie asked about how you get people onto the next thing. Well, the the... The next thing is the mirror. It's the mirror. What gets you over that is the is the mirror. And so, yeah, that's um, uh, just presenting the mirror and stuff to to people is is an art. But that's what the the shaman does is a, a spirit guide and um, to let you see, you know, gradually see. You see, you have to see the the machine outside, and then see the machine inside. It's it's very easy to get rid of the machine inside. It's it's ten. It's it's a five minute procedure to get rid of the the machine inside you. And all you need to do is you just basically go here up in the left orbital eye socket there, put an ice pick there, just smack it in, and then just like twiddle the ice pick around for a little bit, and that's it. There'll be no more no more alien cortex, no more ego. Um, Walter Friedman did it to thousands of people. So if you if you want to get rid of your alien cortex, right, and uh, and defeat it, it's easy, easy procedure. You can just do it, do it with an ice pick. I suggest you don't, <laughs> because the the path to liberation, right, the path to survival and liberation is is to transform your alien cortex, right? To, you may, it's to go through a metamorphosis into what? I don't want to tell you what into what. It's just in the language of the alien cortex, into a butterfly or some shit. <laughs> it's actually, you know, basically, alien cortex is gone. But the, so, but the, think of it, you know, as a birthing process or a transformation. So you don't want to excise it. You don't want to give yourself a lobotomy. So you, so you know, this intellectualism is a is a is a, a kind of a um, foreplay for lobotomy. Is what 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 Kings North is doing is he's with his writing is he's doing a foreplay for lobotomy, and so, uh, but also religion is doing that. Orthodox Orthodox religion is a lobotomy, uh, just going for alcohol, going for Self medicating yourself with drugs and stuff is is a lobotomy. It's a form of it's a form of escapism, just like the metaverse is. The kids are using their phones now for escapism. That's that's a lobotomy. And so basically, you you have a, a lobotomy by Twitter, or you know, is is what everybody's doing. You d you don't want to tackle the alien cortex that way. It's you we want to get rid of the alien cortex. We want to get rid of ego, but it's 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 a a, a transformation and that transformation is done by reflection literally the word re reflection is in, in the mirror and also 
um, you know, like reflecting on something, like you say, you think about it. Just keep on thinking about it. Time to think. Uh, you see, the machine doesn't want to give you time to think because, you know, then, then it starts to unravel quick. And so there, there's this big tyranny of taking your time, taking your time, you know, sort of stealing from the, the thief of time. And the, the reason for that is so that it, you know, basically... The, these are defenses that the alien cortex does, and one of them is to waylay you. So I've, I've told you all the defenses it does. The, the very first one is inversion, right? So, so King North hasn't got that. He doesn't understand that this, he's an upside-down world, right? So the very first uh, way that the ego, the alien cortex, defends itself is inversion. That's the primary one. Then the next one is substitution. It's like, say, okay, okay, you've got me. The world is upside down. But anyway, here, have a scapegoat. Not me. Don't, don't sacrifice me. Here, have this. And so that basically that's an old, old thing. That, you know, it goes back to biblical times. It's the root of all sacrifice, ritual sacrifice, religious sacrifice. Is the alien cortex saying to death, take this instead of me. So that's, you know, it's so imbued in our culture that our, our culture is one of, of semblances and, and uh, appearances and stuff, and so you know, it's the metaverse. It's say, don't, don't, don't take the real world. You know, just here, take this artificial substitute of the world. Don't take this real food. Take this, you know, manufactured substitute. Don't take this real health. Take this health that we sold to you in a bottle. You know, so all of these substitutes, the intermediaries, intermediaries. You know, don't have freedom. Have a government. Don't, don't have, don't have a real spiritual experience. Have one on drugs. Don't, don't don't really go and talk to God. Let the Pope intercede for you. So it's all always intercession, intercession, substitution. And then this is the prime thing about Christians. Because then it's like, no, don't go through the transformation yourself. Jesus did it for you. Yeah, you know, you don't have to go to the trouble. It's been prepackaged for you. You know, you don't have to suffer and die on the cross. It's Jesus did it for you. Substitution. Relax. And it's like, don't be sold down the river. You have to go through the passion. <laughs> That's what we all do. The Christians are saying you don't have to because Christ did it for you. That's evil. And that's what Kings North is going to start selling people if he starts going too far down this path. Okay, so that's substitution. Another one is basically um, diversion. So then, you know, if, if if you actually see the bull and try and tackle it, it goes, hey, squirrel. <laughs> and that's what everybody does. You know, everybody's got, oh, well, my time's up. My time's up. The clock runs out on me. So it keeps on running the clock out on me. So it basically, nobody is, see, the, we'll get on to the thing about uh, the manifesto and that. But you see, one of the reasons why nobody will look at the manifesto is because, oh, they haven't got the time. You know, it's too long. They haven't got the time. And it's like, what are the, you know, oh, really? You've got to run? What do you got to run to? More ephemeral nonsense shit. It's just running from one thing to another. So it's basically, it's just diversion, 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 diversion. And then suddenly the clock runs out and <gasps> you've got a heart attack. And you're like, oh, but I was going to be spiritually realized. I was going, ugh. Oh, clock ran out on you. <laughs> it's like, hey, hey, alien cortex wins. <laughs> and then the, um, the, 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 the last one is just, just distraction, just distracting you from, from, from actually getting it. But th those are the techniques it uses. And so it, it, so this machine is, is metaphysical. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's literal in the fact that it's just a small little layer here. But this small little layer here represents something much bigger. It's a cosmic force. It's, uh, you know, it's basically the principle of the, the discrete or the ego or the part or, you know, as opposed to the continuous and the whole, <laughs> which is the rest of the thing. So, so anyway, okay, I hope I got all this across. Is there, like, any questions? And then let's go on to this really cool thing that I want to tell you about. Thank <laughs> about you so much. What? Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much for clarifying and, and reminding uh, things we've already, but it's, you've put it in a very good context with the machine. And thank you very much. But uh, before we move on to, I don't know, the manifesto, but Gary was mentioning a few things that are related to what we're talking about in his comment 
um, the cult idea, the guru meditation. And do you want to approach these subjects or do you want to, it's, it's enormous, um, whatever. Uh, no, no, we should, we should, uh, we'll get, we'll get to them. So let's, let's do the manifesto. Can I just, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, just going back to Sam Mitchell, are you saying that he was taking on Alan Watts as a kind of messianic figure, you know, taking on Watts yeah. as a religious exercise? Yeah, I, I see a bit of danger there because mm. you see, he's there. There's a misogynist, not misogynistic, uh, misanthropic, misanthropic yeah. in San. In San yeah, you see. so that's right. He's he's all about you know ecology and a lot of the guys on on like Manga Bay and stuff. There's there's this uh, they they hate humans, but you see what they got. It's just a problem of of acuity right they just basically are not distinguishing properly so you you mustn't hate humans you must hate this part of the human just this tiny mm. little bit but they mm. taking you see their alien cortex is is the alien cortex is self-loathing the reason why it wants to kill us is it's trying to kill itself right it doesn't like itself it's it's um the, it it is the ultimate you know self-hating <laughs> thing but um it's, uh, you see, someone like an ecologist, they they love nature and, and the world, the animals. They've normally, had, in childhood and stuff, have a close attachment to, to the wild and to nature and so forth. It means that the, the four other layers are really wired up. Right? They have a soul, they have a heart. Um, a heart, of course, like being a mammalian brain. And stuff. So they have this native affinity for the wild. They then they take they say humans are destroying my mother. And then they hate all of the human. And you say, no, no, we also came from nature. We are also part of nature. You can't destroy humans. We you know you the very thing that you love uh and you hate being destroyed um Actually, also we are part of that. Humans didn't weren't didn't land on this planet from outer space, but this part of us did. Okay, so the reason why I call it the alien cortex because it is really a foreign thing. It's, it's the Neanderthal part of us. It's the Neanderthal inside, in effect. And so, but what do you do? Alien, almost literally, one way or one way or another, we we'll always bump up against this problem that that final understanding such as just what you've said now of, of miss of sort of uh failing to understand that it's a certain module in human beings and not not the totality of them which is the problem but you, you never hear of it and and people so very really arrive at that realization by themselves and the same thing with uh you know, even people like Kings North and other people who go for some kind of religious uh, panacea because they genuinely have never heard or suspected or thought in their whole lives. It just hasn't occurred to them that there might be a third rail here, you know, a, 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 a something that yeah, they've never all... conceived of. And, Where... of course, it, it's part of the trap. But it, yes, but I think you, indigenous people don't have this, right? So no, so but indigenous see, but indigenous culture, people never lost their contact with it in the first place, so they didn't have to refind it from knowing. Yeah, from not, not, exactly. yeah. Think, it's yeah. not as if they lost. They, 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 they yeah. you, you know, got people in the society we live in who are, are legitimately clueless about this. Um, uh, and 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 so you, you you know, and really too, when you look at it, the other problem is. The fact that they are operating from the the alien cortex is um, that simple fact blocks them because they're looking for what they when they're looking for some other way or some other solution they're looking for it with their thought process and the ver the very thought process is what locks them out of finding it and and therefore they're, they're forever completely. Uh, it just is sort of this permanent blind spot that unless somebody comes out of the blue like you or Alan Watts, if you know how to listen to Alan Watts, and says, oh, hey, 
you know, uh, hang on for a minute, you know, it, uh, uh, it's not like that at all. They're never going to get a clue. And so they're going to perpetually fall back onto the established things that, off, uh, uh, you know, offer themselves up as the solutions in these positions, such as, you know, religions or, or you know, sort of, you know, ecological misanthropy and all this kind of thing. Um, you know, so it, we really just, I just see this is a massive problem of if you just leave people alone to their own devices, how the hell would they arrive at this? You know, we're totally dependent on these few people who do get it. Um, look, uh, look uh, this is what, one of the things, uh, you know, as a, as a shaman or doctor of the human spirit, um, this is one of the tragedies is that there's not many people you can save under this society is <laughs> like it's uh, like caged chimps man they uh, you know they, you can't really introduce them back into the wild if they've been too domesticated you, you i'm sure you've seen all the tragic stories of how they've tried to reintroduce chimps that were used for medical experiments or were used in hollywood or something like that and they try and take them back to their native habitat and it doesn't really work and so the you know, a large portion of the 7.8 billion people on this planet are, you know, 50% of them are now urbanized and caged. And so the, you know, you can't expect a very big crop. <laughs> Another thing that's important is, you know, like you said, Gary, with people being trapped in their thoughts, but another thing is people are only ever taught the, the inhumanity of this system as humanity, right? They, they, that's all they're taught. The inhumanity of this machine. Oh, it, yeah. it, oh, it's worth since you brought that up. It's worth it's worth talking about this. So because it's kind like of on, the, on the manifesto. So so okay, look, um, the you know is it, humans left to themselves without government, without the machine and stuff. Uh, when things go bad, they go good. They like it becomes like you know Rebecca Solnit. They work together. It's you know it all falls apart when the government there. That's why you need to remove the government. You need to decapitate it soon in the crisis, because it, it's going to cause trouble for you. It's going to be a monkey on your back. You can see that. I mean, look at this. We we would have been far better off. It's becoming increasingly obvious, even to Kings North now. What you know, so Sophie and I, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we put this thing up saying you know, COVID liberates. And I don't think any anybody understood because you know it's obvious where this is going to go, it's, and this is where it's gone. Is that it? You know, it exposes the the guys that you know, the mafia who and their protection racket as a fraud. And so the government has this protection racket. They they tell all these lambs, "We'll protect you," which is a lie. They just out for themselves. But then that's that's the social contract that we'll protect you. In exchange, we take your wool and then eventually have you for mutton. And most people go for that deal, but they don't know that it's like the, the first wolf that comes out, the government's gone. They're not, they're not going to hang around to see how to hang. So, uh, so, it, so you know, you, this, what this pandemic has done is it exposed that we would have been better off without that, right? It, what everybody now is starting to realize is, you know, these guys dicked us around for two years. They made it worse. But, you know, if, if there was no such thing as big pharma and we just basically went through this ourselves, you know what? It would have been way better. And so I agree with people that. People starting yeah. to realize the contract is, is, is not worth the paper it's written on. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um... exactly. Yeah, and without like people being plugged into the matrix and the authority around like those other brain layers come into play with people interacting with each other. And that's where humanity is. But you know, we're not taught that in school. We're taught to serve the bullet points of rules and all that BS. And it doesn't work. It only works for the system. Okay, okay. But now now comes the important bit. Listen up here, right? So it might sound like I'm talking two different messages because on the one hand you have mutualism and the natural mutualism you see in disasters like the san francisco earthquake and stuff like that but uh, rebecca solnit uh writes about right uh okay uh 
it might sound like I'm saying saying that, you know, when I say stuff about Kings North and I say, you know, one day you're going to get a knock on the door and <laughs> you're going to go through a trial that you just, you're not prepared for and you probably will commit suicide afterwards because you just can't take the trauma. So I saying like, that might sound like, you know, I'm talking against myself or into you know, contradicting myself, but uh, okay. We are in Auschwitz. The system is Auschwitz. It's a prison yard. When, when it's a, it's in collapse already in the collapse of Auschwitz, you go, go back and read about what those guys did in the last days of those camps and stuff. They go a little bit freaking nuts. We're seeing mass formation. Now it's going to get a lot, lot worse than this. Okay. It doesn't matter if you're on the west coast of Ireland and, you know, you think you in some protected little village. It doesn't work like that. There's no home is left untouched in this, in what we're about to see. I mean, just for, you know, Kings North might be on the west coast of Ireland and think he's got his little permaculture heaven in there. And so I'm like, he's going to get a knock on the door. <laughs> like we all are. In some way, you're going to get it. You don't know. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe you get drafted into the war. Maybe you're in an island that's next to, you know, 64 million people and they can only feed half themselves. So, you know, everybody in England, when you talk about refugee crisis, they, they imagine brown people coming to Britain. No. Britain is an island that is a, a refugee crisis waiting to happen, right? Because basically, if you, if you have twice as many people as the land can feed, you're in deep trouble in the world that's coming. So where are those people going to go? They can get on a raft and go to Ireland. You might have millions of, I mean, Cromwell did it. You could do it tomorrow, right? The, all, the, all the guys that are coming here to Greece, right? That can be Ireland in a little while. I mean, why wouldn't you? If you're in threads, right? With, you, do you think that people don't know that Ireland is just across there and there's hardly populated? And, you know, one guy comes back and says, hey, you know, there's food for the taking over there. It's like, and then so you could well conceivably have marauding bunches of football hooligans and they will give you a knock on the door in the night and something to remember. Because, you see, the, the although the Rebecca Solner thing works is these guys are products of the prison yard. The millions and millions of people with the mindset and product of the million. So, so there is a period where you, you have to, you know, negotiate the, the mayhem in the prison. Yard. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and you, you know, get a gun. <laughs> it won't hurt you. Get a gun. <laughs> you know, so, uh, or, or, or know somebody that has a gun. But anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to paint this picture is that, you, the way collapse goes down is goes down in stages and it's very, you know, cure its egg. It, it matters which part you're in. It matters which, um, you know, whether you have mutualists in a group and stuff like that. Uh, so it, just, just by the way, just while we're on the subject of the defection of the, the, the overlords, um, I, I posted this thing about this Korean um, ferry that's that same, and I thought that re go over that in detail because that that should be compulsory watching for all libtards, because that is a huge tragedy. All these kids, if you didn't see it, all these kids died on this Korean ferry. They they were told that they were obedient. Right, the reason why they all died is because they were obedient, and what they. The school teachers and everything told them to just stay put while the ferry is healing over, right? It's basically, you know, this thing's going to sink. No, no sane person would sit there below deck while this thing was healing over. So they, they had, you know, because they, people have cell phones, all these kids have cell phones and stuff. They got footage of them. And there the thing starts with these kids that are saying, you know, isn't this like what happened on the underground where they told everybody to stay put? And then um, they all died. And the only people that survived were the people that, that disobeyed the orders. And then, the, you know, that's what they were saying. And that's exactly what happened to them. Those people, those poor kids on that video, they died. So, so that's how badly ingrained this is. Just think how horrible this is. That for most people, they know the story. 
they actually discussed the story and they still wouldn't disobey so so what so uh, basically when while they were saying all of this the the they said oh well i'm sure the captain and crew would tell us i'm sure the authorities are looking after us the authorities were getting off the captain abandoned the ship before the passengers he right there on video he told them to stay in lockdown below deck him and the crew they donned life jackets they didn't tell anybody else to don life jackets and they stepped off the boat before it capsized right it's horrendous crime. The captain's supposed to go down with the boat. Anyway, that's the situation we're in with the government now. That everybody thinks awesome. the government will let us know. They'll give us orders and stuff. No. The government's going to make a getaway and to keep you in lockdown. Those people were, died because they listened to the lockdown orders. So what do you do in that situation? If you remember the ex Extinction Hardy and stuff, is you, you have to be disobedient. You must be ingrained in your... In, to that you know distrustful of authority and ingrained disobedience so if so you don't have to make a big song and dance about it if you were one of those kids on the thing this is what i would have done if if i was that age because i'll give you a lot of stories about where where i did it is all you've got to say is to the t you know you don't stand up to the teacher and say oh fuck you i'm not gonna die just because i'm listening to you yeah, you know, and then run out on deck, which would have saved you, is basically all you've got to do is saying, I need to go to the bathroom. And they say, no, you're not allowed to go. I, I can't help it. Bye. <laughs> That's all you have to do. <laughs> Don't have to make a big stand. Don't have to, just have to go. Yeah, this was the same with um, in Grenfell, um, Grenfell Tower in London, where they were all told to stay. And that was the protocol. And yeah, but all the people that survived, of course, they went, no, fuck this. And they got out and they were ringing up the emergency services, you know, and they were saying, oh, no, you need to stay put because that was the original drill. And it's like, but now the smoke's coming and it's getting really hot. And it's like, fucking hell, unbelievable. Yeah, go look at the so people all these in poor the, people, the you know, towers. hundreds go of people, people died. in the Twin Towers on 9 11. Yeah, and the Costa all Concordia. Of, all of those, as well. They told them to all stay at the top of the building and they said, that, you know, our help will be on its way. And it was lying. Basically, the only people that got out of the Twin Towers were the people that disobeyed orders. So just don't forget this. <laughs> we see this lesson over and over again, and then you don't have the balls to really follow through. So I'm, I'm just saying you, you don't have to be a hero and shout, shout loudly and stuff. You, you know, this is the situation we're in in so many levels. This, what we're doing when the extinction ID is I'm, I am, we are these kids on this boat, on this call, we are the kids on this boat, right? I hope this is getting across to you. And so basically, I'm what I'm telling you is I'm the kid in the back saying like, guys, it's not worth sitting here listening to teacher. It's like, you know, we got to get out of here. And the, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll give I'll up shouting. I've given up shouting. I, I can't be bothered anymore. I keep being all like righteous and like rebellious and trying to speak my mind to people and it's just it's just not worth it people just they can't they, yeah, just but I, so I, they I can't, to can't stand don't, it don't don't despair doesn't don't despair so i i get to this point quite quite often and i think everybody in our position does is that is um okay let's use the go-to analogy of this ferry boat or the titanic or something something like that is i, I often get to the point where especially if i'm on reddit and stuff and i just, and all like revolutionaries, anyway, you know, Lenin got to this point, Stalin got to this point, Mao got to this point, or everybody gets to this point um, uh, where they, they go like, you know, I've busted a gut for these people. Is it worth it? I mean, it's like at the end of the day, they are just sheep. You know, it's may, maybe the transhumanists, maybe the overlords are right. I mean, th these guys want to be sheep. They behave like sheep. They know the story. They know that they're going to give. They will. They know everything. It's like they are, to all intents and purposes, sheep. Why don't we? Yeah, but it's a self-fulfilling like prophecy. Here, but the, if they're treated like sheep and brought up like sheep, you know, I mean, it's a circular thing. The 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 the, the system. Yeah, yeah is but I'm not. I'm not casting blame. I'm just talking strategies for survival. And so here's the thing: is that so so you know often I think like you know why don't I just why do I go to this trouble? Why don't I just try and survive on my own? 
the thing is in the manifesto i'll put it there is like it, where we're going through now you you the chances of you getting through this as a loner are low okay so uh, just out of self-interest you want to be in a mutual support group or something like the extinction hunter so let me give you this example if say you you're on the titanic right then you know, I've, I've spent so many years trying to tell people what's coming and then just being ridiculed and laughed at and everything, everything you see now. I've told people they're going to be, you know, these passports and that. Ah, shit. I've, uh, you know, you, you don't get any points for being Cassandra. Everybody just hates you when your predictions come true. But so, so you know, in all of this, then you th I often think like, you know, why don't I just survive the flipping? <laughs> Fuck everybody else. But What's liable to happen on that, that well, that's equivalent on the Titanic to just saying, look, I know this ship's going down. Everybody else is, you know, in denial. These people are having champagne. I mean, look at the crew. The crew are already abandoned ship. It's like, you know, you kind of know what's going on here. Uh, so, so I say, maybe these people are too stupid to, to save. And you just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to save myself. You go up on the top deck and what you should be doing right now at this stage of the Titanic is you should be building a raft. Now, if you go and do that as an individual, the very likely outcome of that is that, you know, three burly guys are going to find you on the deck before you get on that raft. They're going to punch you in the nose and take your raft. That's the highly likely outcome of trying to go it alone. So it doesn't work that way. That individual mindset doesn't ever work out. You need to basically get a group of people in a mindset. It's, it's just, it's just the way the world works. It's the way the humans work. It's, it's the, it's the unit of survival. Humans are only on this planet because we work together. We, we are able to form an egregore because we can have a Kantian whole. That we, we can, you know, have. We can be a part, and we can also be part of the whole. And the whole and the part are always antagonistic towards each other. But that's that's the way it should be. But we can organize us ourselves. Organs come from the human body. From being organized is means you have different organs. It means that we can be complementary and work together. That's what made humans so spectacular. So, but you you have to be in a in a bigger whole than yourself, as, and as big a whole as possible. You see, if you if you get to be a bigger organ, a bigger sort of super organism, then you get to more like the Birkenhead, you know, the wreck of the Birkenhead. Go and have a look at that. That's exemplary, exemplary how you're supposed to be. And the, the Titanic was kind of the, the, the James Cameron selfish lesson, you know, contra lesson of that's not what you want to be. But the Birkenhead, they, everybody worked together. They were just exemplary and they, they were organized. So that basically, they were Kantian whole. The whole served the parts, and the parts parts served the whole. Nobody was completely out there to be messianic and self-sacrificing and on some fucking Saint Paul ego trip. No one was doing that. No, no one was overly ready to sacrifice other people. It, everything's like when it was required for some guys to sacrifice themselves, and I mean, it was harsh. The in the Birkenhead, the uh, the soldiers. Um, you basically had to jump into the sharks. So most of them went with sharks and deliberately, right? They, the people, the lifeboats tried to come and uh, save some of them and they waved them off. So just think of those guys, man. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. To wave That's off a amazing. rescue boat because the rescue boats were full. The guys um, waved them off. Uh, and you know, so they could be eaten by sharks. I mean, Jesus. But but uh, Birkenhead, no, not the Titanic. Sorry, what was the name of of the boat? The, the wreck the of the Birkenhead. Boat. It was a ship going to South Africa, wasn't it? And they they ran yeah, aground on the rocks. And um, the yeah, they just coast, yeah, yeah. So. Incredible so story. We, we, I posted we, a video about it. We, we were all taught about the wreck of the Birkenhead and stuff because, you know, it's English colonial and we went through the English colonial system. So we were taught it as part of, you know, to make us good 
colonial administrators. But it it is how you know it is how you survive. You see, um, a remarkable number of people survive. Probably the maximum possible on the Birkenhead, and it's although it was taught to us as a colonial thing. Um, the lessons are, are solid. And it's it's not what we're heading for. You see, those guys need a lot of preparation. That mindset that they had um, took generations in the making. So we kind of, as a society, we're heading into the, the biggest trial humanity's ever had, and we're kind of doing it without training. What I'm trying to do with you guys and with these is to, is to try and give you some some training. I mean, I, you, if we're doing it in perp in you know in, in person and uh, you know if you, okay if if I was given everybody as a military unit and it would take three months to train everybody, <laughs> but because everybody's remote and it's it's like herding egos, you know, it's like it's it's incredibly difficult to give something like basic military training over the internet but, because it's not practical and personal, and you don't have the you're not everybody's here is like. This one's here because it's a lifestyle thing. This one's here because of this and stuff. And so you all have to accommodate that and kind of put it all together. You know, if in the military, no one has a choice. They've got to sit there and pay orders. And it's kind of easy to train. But uh, so so to train, you can train anybody. Um, but the way you see, the, the difficult thing is to get people's attention. And maybe now we get onto the manifesto. Um, but it's very hard to get people's attention and keep it because of distraction thing. Um, and so the, the thing is to, is how, how do you actually train a force and get their attention? Well, it, it's, it's done by shock, right? It's done by shock. So this uh, Sun Chu in the art, art of War. Um, I don't know if, no, it's not in the Art of War. It's, uh, I think it was just, one of the stories told, I think, about Shang Shu. I'm not sure about that one. Anyway, forget the details. Uh, it's basically called uh, uh, the maybe it's called the lesson from the concubines or something like that. But anyway, uh, this I think Wu Emperor um, hired Sun Shu or something like that to uh, to make a, a force out of them, and, and he said, you know, can you make a force out of these? peasants a military force and he said yeah you could make a force out of anybody i could make a force out of your you know your geishas basically your concubines and so the emperor laughed and said, <laughs> he said like okay go said go for it um and so sun chu like you know lined them all up and um you know put as uh marshaled them as if uh, on parade and they were all like you know they all basically libtards they're all domesticated and, <laughs> and they don't know whether they're girls or boys <laughs> and they, you know they're all like twittering and you know and exactly like all these these liberals the, you know so this is where where we at we've got this kind of geisha army and so so then Sanchu said you know okay when you hear the drums you line up in formation and so they're play the drums and stuff and they all just <laughs> giggled and they'll go all silly and stuff and then he said like okay let, let's see if you understood the command and the first thing is how you know he says that if the commander gives a command and it's he must make sure that it's un understood by the troops if, if he doesn't make sure then it's the commander's fault so he made sure he said did you understand the command and everything so they said um he picked out two the two leaders of the geishas. Obviously, even geishas have <laughs> you know, leaders. And he, he picked out two of them and he says, Did you understand? And he made sure that there was no miscommunication. And he said, Okay, now you understood the thing, we're gonna do it again. When you hear the drums, you marshal. And it happened again. And he said, Okay, come here. He's like, gets the two the, the two leaders. And he just chopped their heads off right there in front of the, the emperor. Basically, he used uh, Roman decimation tactic, and instantly, the the rest of the guys were shocked. So they instantly behaved like soldiers, just like that. You know, hear the drums. <laughs> they were, well, the floor was a bit sticky, I guess, but they were they were all marshaled. In there. 
and that's that's what has to happen a little bit. So, so here's the thing: it's going to happen anyway. See, everybody's all like doing their little thing and not taking it seriously. And Hugh's a bit of a nutcase because you know, isn't this being melodramatic and you know, all of this stuff? And you say like, well, all of that stuff ends abruptly when there's blood on the floor, and there's going to be blood on the floor real soon. <laughs> So when the bullets start flying, and and see what happens to soldiers when the bullets start flying, and these your comrades start dropping around you, that's when you 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 stop thinking and you go into your training. You 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 become almost a robot relying on the training that you get, the training that I'm giving you now. You see what what if if it works out like I'm doing is like at some time in your in your ordeal you will hear Hugh's voice and remember these things that I told you suddenly these stories I told you will make sense and you'll go they'll help you survive because it's it's training I'm putting drop by drop the training you'll need to survive so it, so but see when the bullets start flying then everybody you know starts relying on their training and then, then that's a different thing. It's, it becomes like flow. So, but you see, where we're at now is all these libtards and all these egotists and narcissists and all these false prophets and all these fake gurus and stuff. But it's a mess, right? And so, so not there's not much training at this stage. You should be like battle ready, right? If if this was a military trip, you'd be you should be battle ready by today. So what's going to happen is these these people are going to the bullets are going to start flying and they will have no training or very little to fall back on. Yeah. So yeah, that's so that's it. anyway. I, anyway, on a lighter note, I I got to tell you this um, on Friday about the last bit about Alan Watts is that um, so so. So there's this great couple <laughs> who uh, do podcasts, and they interviewed me for a podcast, right? And it was awesome because we had like a two and a half hour discussion. It was just great, and I recorded it on Jitsi. And here's where we made a mistake: we discussed the machine, and whenever I discuss the machine, there's always a glitch, <laughs> and that's what happened. So we got four minutes into this, and um, you know I was recording it to job, and then suddenly it went weird, and there's the Jitsi meeting like hiccuped, and then I was dropped, and then I came back again, and I thought it was still recording, and it wasn't. But anyway, it was weird. What was doubly weird was then some some other prick comes on. It was just the three of us, and suddenly this other prick comes on. Is like is. It says IT on his thing. It was just IT. And so he was saying, like, hello, who are you? And stuff. And he disappears. And then he comes back on again. And he's saying, like, oh, he's saying, like, oh this must be Talpo, Talpiot or Unit 8200. It's like, he was saying, like, hello, how's the weather in Tel Aviv? <laughs> and then, like, he disappeared again. So, anyway, it was weird. But so, anyway, oh, that was me. Anyway. That was me. I didn't realize it was like a private thing. And I tried to come on just to listen. And uh, yeah, I, I just but automatically got kicked know? out, and I, then how I realized, you know? I was like, I, I don't know. know. What? Oh, no, I'll tell you what happened. No, I was just finishing work. That was weird. And I put my phone in my pocket, and I don't know if it was just a fluke that I accidentally, you know, that my phone menu, I touched, and it went in straight into Jitsu. And, I, and then I heard some speaking, and I was like, what? And I picked my phone out of my pocket. I was just about to walk out of the building. And there was you guys. I was like, oh, he's, he's on a call. Oh, yeah. He said he was going to do that meeting on Friday because you said you were busy. And I was like, oh, and I went to go and make sure it was muted and, you know, and everything. And then I got in the car and I thought, oh, I'll listen in because I didn't see that there was no one else on it apart from you and your the people you were interviewing. And then, uh, and then of course, it kicked me out straight away. And I was like, oh, OK, it's like a – but I didn't know how that was. Obviously, you set up something to kick people out. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, it didn't. It was it was the hiccup. The hiccup. We didn't kick you out, but but That's anyway, weird. It, it, yeah, it was. It gets weird. It gets weird. By the way, so anyway, um, <laughs> so so uh, here, I think I'm allowed to tell you this. I hope I am. Stop me if I'm not. But I got to tell Alan what. 
So anyway, okay. So so basically, is a, is a gorgeous couple. Um, one in, in California and uh, one in Hawaii. And um, uh, you know, when when we first got on the call, then I saw that uh, you know she, the uh, the woman was on a boat. So I said, oh, you know, <laughs> you you're on a boat too. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm actually. I'm actually on a on a big houseboat. I said, a big houseboat in California. I say, you're not in Sausalito, are you? <laughs> said, well, actually, yeah, <laughs> in Sausalito. I said, like, oh, that's interesting because I used to live in Tiburon, and uh, which is the next headland over. I said, but that's an awfully big looking <laughs> looking houseboat. And she said, yeah. It's Alan Watts's houseboat. Oh man! Because uh, is she the lady who actually restored it? There's a whole story about that boat. I, I posted it on Reddit, or something about it on Reddit. It's got I, I a long it's history. Been, it's been like redone. I think that's been re. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been, it was reholed, and the whole thing was restored. Yeah, uh, it, it, there's a substantial uh, thing to do with that, and it's got a had a very long history before. Uh, it ended up being so when Watts was living on it, uh, it was run aground. It was rotting out. It it, it was basically a Hulk when he had it. You, you, it, it wasn't um, saleable at all. It was it was just round up on the sandbank, from what I gather, um, uh, and then fell into even further disrepair. Once, well, he got it from a very eccentric guy who was an artist uh, who was uh, a bit of a character at the time around the Bay Area, uh, I think there was some scandal, you know, the usual sex crime thing. Um, and then uh, Alan Watts ended up, uh, you know, with the boat for quite a while. But, well, anyway, uh, yeah, later on, later on some lady, there's, did, some woman did buy it and restore it, but whether or not this is the same person, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, well, anyway, um, the, so, uh, yeah, I think that, I think it's got a sister ship. There's there's a ferry that you can go on as a tourist. I've been I've been on that one. I think it's its sister ship. It's some somewhere in downtown SF. But anyway, it's um, I think what, I think maybe Alan Watts's ghost might have fused itself in me or something at that when I was living there. So, so basically, behind that is um, that whole place. If if you don't know. No, the area is um, it's very big in the psychedelic area. That that I posted the thing about the conference. That that houseboat is very famous for the houseboat conference in 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 sixty seven. I think sixty seven was it. But anyway, I posted it there for you to see. But uh, Alan Watts died on in a little lodge on Mount Tamalpay, which is the mountain behind Tiburon and Sausalito. Nineteen seventy two. Yeah. 72, 73, yeah, something. Uh, 70, 72, it was, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. he, uh, well, well anyway, it's the, the whole... result of the result well, of uh, alcohol and too much smoking, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a good yeah. way to go. But anyway, the whole place is like totally steeped in beatnik culture and all these famous mm. guys, and then Stinson Beach is on the other. So if you're a local, it's not Mount Tamalpay. It's you call it Mount Tam, Mount Tam. <laughs> but, but anyway, it's um, yeah, that's the place and um, Mill Valley and all San Rafael all around there. But the, but anyway, Stinson Beach. If you if you go there, it's it, it's a mecca for um, tourists on the Beatnik Trail, and then it's just. It's LSD city. <laughs> it's just, I mean, you, you just walk into Stinson Beach. Um, it's, you know, it's just an acid trip. <laughs> just, just, just going there, you have an acid trip. <laughs> so it's, anyway, uh, anyway, I had to share that with you because it was, you know, such a, uh, the ghost of Alan Watts haunts us. Is uh, is one of his sons is still around with some kind of an archive of his stuff? I think in that area, uh, just can't remember the details now. Um, but you know, it might have been in the remnants of Millwood or something. There was a lot of buildings there, apparently. Um, uh, oh, I mean, I'd never been there, but he had about seven kids from from uh, yeah, and abandoned. Well, 
you know, it's not a nice way to put it, but he abandoned the uh, the both families. Um, when when he f- first came from England to um, to the States, was uh, he married the daughter of some wealthy lady, and uh, that was when he was a uh, Episcopalian priest or became one, uh, and and that was uh, also protected him from the war, which was a good thing. Um, and then uh, he got uh, uh, well. He had to exit from the from the priesthood because of uh, his extramarital affairs. Uh, and it was when he left the the children from that first marriage. And then he had a, a another one where he had you know four quite a few more children. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think at that stage he had uh, realised that he had a mission. And that being in this domestic environment and tied down like that was just so such a grievous thing for what was boiling up inside of him that 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 he really had to go to the extreme of just walking out on them. But uh, he did um, his eldest daughter from his first marriage, and uh, and at, at least one of the sons from the second one he he uh, was in you know in contact with them. And, and one of those boys uh, has got some kind of an archive. I can't remember his first name now. Um, uh, or was trying to get together some kind of an archive of, of uh, his recordings. Because they're just masses and masses of his, his recordings. Uh, and so many pirate copies and all sorts of things, you know. But the, the big the big thing about Watts is there's just so much surviving recorded material for him. Um, it's just such a goldmine. Um so yeah, I mean his life story, and then his third wife was the one uh, who was uh, uh, with him when he died. Like, well, he died during, during one night in his sleep, and uh, and that was at, uh, at Mount Tamalpais, somewhere there in one of those uh, cabins in the woods, you know, because um, he used to uh, uh, sort of do his dealings with people on the ferry. But he was getting too popular, and, and you know it was getting quite stressful for him to be there. And he, he'd so, so he'd leave the ferry and go off into the woods to get away from them all, and then come back down to be the guru and, and everything, and then go back up, you know, get away from them again. So he, he was sort of going between the two places. Yeah, well, I mean, this is kind of on topic because it's like you know, it's it's very hard to be a guru these days. Um, or be a genuine one. It's easy to be. Joe Rogan, I guess. <laughs> but, well, see, that but, was the um, thing. He found he was getting the idolization thing, you know, and getting getting unwanted people coming. You know, it it, it was getting to that sort of cultish thing for, for some of those people. And I think he realized he had to keep away from it. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't avoid a cult, right? Uh, so enough uh, times it's like... Everything's a cult, so it's just like pick a cult. <laughs> you know, you, we're gonna go. You can be a loner, in which case I don't give you much hope, or you can join a cult. Uh, but it's cults and cults. That's all you you've got. Yeah, a choice of in the end times. So just pick a what, good one. What was the podcast? Uh, did they record it? The interview with the the, the couple. No, it was all on me. So we'll we'll do it again in like March or something. Who were they here? What were they just anybody, or would they have some kind of a claim to fame? I, uh, yeah, they do have a little bit of claim to fame, but the, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to dox them too badly. No, no, fine. I, I I'm just yeah. curious, but I, yeah, uh, yeah, no, all right. Yeah, so no, no, we'll do it again and put it out. But it was, it was a wonderful conversation. <laughs> so it was like, I just oh, wanted to. Um, anyway. Anyway, it was rather interesting because at the end of it, the, the, they said, well, you know, you always do that kind of exercise and the thing they asked about it and stuff. And I explained to them that it was a, an act of renunciation. It's basically giving up all the fruits of anything that happened on the conversation or anything like that um, to not, you know, be acquisitive, to actually just um, end neutral, give it up. And, and so it was it was very lucky we did that because you really didn't have the recording afterwards. <laughs> Just a little test of how well we did on that exercise. Um, anyway, 
but okay, so uh, next topic, I think, is uh, the, the manifesto and the difficult paragraph um, in it. Um, so, yeah. Anybody want to kick off on just, that? Just before, you, uh, just before you go on to that, I'll just say something and we'll leave it. Um, uh, the, one of the things that I thought of with the uh, meditation, if we get to the point where we talk about that, was to sort of enhance the connection between people in the group. Um, but um, I just thinking about what Tom said, you know, how he sort of accidentally ended up in the meeting. Uh, I, I, I don't think things like that are, are coincidental because uh, I can remember when it happened to me. I remember when you and Mike were having that really good discussion one day. And exactly the same thing happened when I was here. I just accidentally, I was just sort of there and there's Hugh and Mike talking and we're right, I'm right in the middle of the, the exact part of the meeting which was relevant to people interrupting meetings and everything. And, yeah, so I just wanted to, just given that Tom said that, just to uh, point that out, that I think we've already got some kind of a connection going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, my feeling is if ever that kind of thing happens, it's just... You know, uh, uh, just announce yourself and just join the conversation. I don't think it's mm. really, <laughs> you, the, that was one of the things on the, on the menu. I think was to talk about was privacy and yeah. um, security culture. Um, and so I think I made my point with Joe. The I hope I did. Um, the um, okay, I think I might be repeating Don't myself, you but. No, you're off topic. Go back to the manifesto. You're going to start there. So get back to where before, you were. Before, before we start, sorry, and then we get into the manifesto, but to follow what Gary was saying about the group and, you know, like a bit like what we felt when we did the sigil with some of us, um, there was this talk about me a meditation group with Joe and fair play to him. He, I mean, he's trying to get things, you know, a bit, a bit coherent, but... I, I suggested that, you know, we meet every week on Sunday for two meetings. So I personally find it hard to have things in certain times. And I, I just, it's okay to have this on Sunday, but I don't want to go into another timetable where we're going to meet. And So I was thinking, why don't we use the, the meetings as a kind of a, a lighthouse kind of for the for a group med group meditation is a big thing but after the meeting that we'd all kind of give a signal that we're going to meditate for i don't know a little amount of time that we find suitable for us so that we can see a little bit if that has a i don't know a, a, a significance for us and that we feel something i don't know that was because joe wanted to to do once a week we would maybe meditate together, like in the spirit of egregore, uh, whatever, exploration. So I, I suggested that, yeah, after each meeting, we, we just send a little message, for example, on the Discord um, group that Joe has, has set up with you, uh, Hugh, and, uh, and just do it, see, I don't know, what, what do you think of that? Yeah, that would work. It's... it's... It, yeah, I think it needs to be a definite time, but I mean, that's, a, a, you know, well, not a definite time. I mean, a, you, you need to synchronize somehow. So it's, um, you know, it, it would be synchronized after the meeting if people want to do that. that. That is an easy way of synchronizing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, my... Just for what it's worth, my take on it was, to be honest, I'm not actually interested in participating in a meditation as a, as a meditation. But uh, what I am interested in is, is participating in, in the sense of, of what kind of connection can we actually build up I, I, between people in the group, given that there already seems to be a bit of it happening all by itself. Um, just little coincidental things that pop up between, yeah, well. you know, um and you know all i'm i'm just looking at it from the point of view is is well sure you know everybody can use it as a meditation if they want to um <clears throat> but i think it could have this other current running along with it and, and just uh you know report back after a, a couple of months or something and say hey have you noticed anything did, 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 uh, does anyone notice 
uh, that they kind of, you know, knew when Hugh was going to be at a meeting or suddenly thought of something and, and then somebody else said, yeah, I was into that at the same time. And um, Because it's, it's like uh, f- for people all over the planet like we are, that's as close as we're ever going to be able to get. Um, it's, it's the only thing we've got I to wonder... work with. I wonder if we could try and think up some way to do it by Kairos instead of Kronos. So, well, that would just require people to report if they've noticed anything and see if somebody else was into that at the same time, I guess, wouldn't it? Well, so it would be kind of um, retrospective. You know this, yeah, the, um, there's this principle which I think I mentioned, if I didn't mention that, I should have in the Darwin videos, Um, but it's called um, Sheldon, Shelley, Sheldon points or Shelley points, or I can't remember. But anyway, it's uh, it's this this natural convergence points that people were going to, it started with, if it's Sheldon or Shelley, whatever, it's anyway, the guy, whoever it was originally, did this experiment and said, you know, could with some students from Harvard, I think he just said, like, could you meet up in New York on a, you know, on a day? Oh, you know? yeah. You described this once before, a long time ago. Yeah, I yeah. remember it. They it, found it, it was yeah. relatively easy because everybody everybody hit the nodal point, you know. It was mm. like, you know, if it's New York, mm. okay, everybody figured, well, most likely everybody will go to Grand Central Station. Then we're on Grand Central Station under the clock, and then everybody figured, well, what time? And now, well, noon under the clock in Grand Central is obvious, and everybody figured that out and went there. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 is it's those nodal points. Um, a very Kairos way to get there, but maybe let's give it some thought and think about whether we could synchronize by Kairos, and then would be some some event would trigger, and then we would. You know, maybe, maybe some news event or something. You predict, do a Cassandra prediction. Then, if if it happens, everybody knows, and everybody would get up, get online, on on say Jitsi or something like that. Jitsi, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's think about that one. But anyway, I would like to do both. Um, I'd like to do that and also just. The meditation practice, I think, is would be good for people. But I think, yeah, okay. Anyway, so, so are we ready for the? the, the <laughs> you, you're going to leap into the, the manifesto. But... The manifesto. Yeah, go on. Oh, oh well, maybe before we get there, it's like I'll tell you my experience. You remember, so last time, just um, we we talked about how how to just. Be, get some attention, doing some marketing for it. And, and so I so said, Ryan suggested that I we, we do a little test with, um, see what average citizen uh, is, would be like. So I thought, we, yeah, I said I'd do like with Extinction Rebellion. So I did, I tried to put it on Extinction Rebellion and, and um, other people um also tried to put it uh, there um i called in a few favors from some people in extinction rebellion and they put it on but um then ratio five saw it all all the time and like removed it very quick i asked him to put it on i said you know just for old time's sake and and he didn't even respond so that's how bad we are there but so what i did was i found this other site called top minds of reddit which is if you haven't seen it, it's uh, 113,000 guys who really just um, sort of liberal Democrats. They're basically libtards. And uh, and it, the whole site is just designed to ridicule conspiracy theories. And most of their time is spent ridiculing the guys on our conspiracy. Um, and so it's, it's this kind of horrible little millennial thing where they use sarcasm and um and ridicule to try and you know belittle people into you know out of the right-wing beliefs kind of thing and so it was it was pretty much yeah i thought it was pretty much uh 
the Extinction Rebellion crowd. And so I went there and I did this little thing where I put put something up where I trolled them and then I, I back trolled them on our site and then admitted to trolling and just did this little circle. Um, and I thought it was would only be about two seconds before it was taken or taken down. But it, one of them actually lasted. I mean, it was voted down to hell. But um, I got to interact with these these guys quite a lot. And um, I got to do what we said we'd do is basically just a bit of market research. So so how, how it worked was, um, the, you know, if you've ever been um, exposed to marketing, um, is everybody still there? I don't. I don't have any cameras. Yep. Yeah. I'm okay. still here. Okay. Yeah. So. So. Um, okay. So the. So. Uh, this is how it unfolded. Is yeah. Yeah. We're listening. <laughs> so, so they're basically five types. So if you've if you've ever, you know, had to have the root canal therapy of like corporate marketing, you you know that what they often do is they make, um, you know five or so personas of the target market. And then, you know, they often give them names and stuff like that. And that's how it worked out on this, that you can see they're obviously fine. It, it just so happens we're ahead of the game in the Extinction Hardy because they're easily distinguishable as the five brain layers. So a quick summary is it, you can get the, fir the first one is say the alien cortex guy, and it's normally a pedantic guy and, to my ear, it always sounds a bit German. <laughs> very, very literal. Uh, all they're trying to do is they're trying to smack you down, um, you know, get the, the one-upmanship, and um, and then everybody upvotes. And so, so you you never they're never going to look at the at the manifesto. They they just um, want to do a smackdown. And so, uh, what I did with those guys is, if you just let them stand. Um, then, you know, everybody upvotes, oh, he's you, we showed him, you know, so, so you can't let them win. And so all you, the strategy for that is you just drag the guy down into the mud. So you just mud, mud wrestle him like a pig and just come back one for one so that it doesn't end. And what you see is that people, eventually it just starts to get into a mud slinging match and you can see people lose the thread and stuff. And so then they, that's the way I, to handle them. Uh, and it's still, because it's a, an easy exit. Um, people just want one wants anything unusual or anything shut down. So, so that's the way I handle that one. Then the next one is kind of like the monkey brain, and then the the primate brain. It's all <laughs> you know, and trolling and all of this kind of thing. And what you do with that is you just do it back. So it, it all it, it's like basically. Mowgli in the Jungle Book in the Disney version, and it's all <laughs> and hoo -hoo -hoo in the and all you do is just hold up the mirror. Monkey don't like mirror. Monkey don't like mirror. So you, if you if you do <laughs> back again, <clears throat> then suddenly the the volume level in the room suddenly gets a lot quieter, and all the monkey business stops quickly. Yeah, I mean uh, monkeys don't read manifestos, so you can ditch that. The, the interesting one is the next one is the mammalian brain because the mammalian brain is all like agreeable and tries to be personable. And uh, a, so the, the alien cortex is, you know, the intellect's not really in gear, but, you know, the heart is there and trying to placate it and make, keep everything friendly and stuff. So there you can have an inter interesting dialogue, right? And so I couldn't get anybody there to actually read it. But it's amazing how many people will spend... 20 minutes, an hour writing long replies um, rather than actually spend 10 minutes reading the manifesto. But, but anyway, that's the way it is. And so, but what I noticed was uh, that makes a thread that people will look at because you, you can use the mammalian brain as like a useful idiot to just say, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> just tease them along, giving bits of information. And then you, you can see that people start to fo follow that thread. And, and then, you know, the, maybe people looked at the manifesto from there. But anyway, you, you're talking very low hit rates here. This is about the hit rate you'd get in a mailing campaign or something. So if, if you don't know about marketing, if you do like a mail shot, um, very low participation rate is like under one percent is very good for for my show um 
uh, oh yeah so yeah it's 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 long so, so oh by the way i uh, you know somebody suggested asking george uh Sacrakides about it and so i sent him an email and yeah sure enough he, he said um that he said man that's so long he said can you just give me like a five bullet summary <laughs> like that's that's everybody. Nobody's got time to read. Um, <laughs> um, That's funny. But uh, so, so basically, uh, yeah, the upshot of what. So yeah, if, uh, the, the so that's the the reptilian brain. The reptilian guy is like, you know, you're a twat. It's <laughs> like, fuck all. <laughs> and it's like you you're not gonna go anywhere with that. It's not even worth responding. In in because you know you're not. The whole point is to use these people as useful idiots because you, you're trying to get the lurkers. So you're just, just trying. And and also, um, the guys that are not bright enough to know that the more they participate, the more they, you know, the algorithm boosts the... So even if they downvote it to hell, uh, you know, Reddit doesn't care. Reddit Reddit wants uh, participation. Again, it's the, the alien cortex's delay. You know, it's basically... It's, it wants to waylay everybody and wants eyeballs. So... Reddit's looking for attention. So if it looks like there's a feeding frenzy, then you know the algorithm boosts you. And not, these guys are trying to bury you and shut you up and close down the conversation. But they don't realize that it, the more they try and do that, the more the algorithm boosts them. They're not that bright. But but the um, uh, anyway, the, so you can use the reptilian brain for for that kind of thing because you know the more mudslinging you do the more the more it'll bubble up and the more people will see it at the risk of the fact that they will you know decide that this is a load of shit but the yeah in general it's like really low batting average on this kind of thing so i mean it's so the net result is is exactly what gary said in the last in the last meeting is that it's in you know it, there's so many crank theories out on on the internet and everybody's so jaded and so prejudiced and they, they just like oh we've seen all this unscientific shit before and so the 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 one so yeah this is a, a tough road to hoe i mean it's so tough that you know you, people say about uncle ted right they they say like oh he didn't have to do that you know I mean, his manifesto is brilliant and stuff, but he didn't have to do what he did. And it's like, horseshit. You, to get people to read this manifesto, you basically have to do what Uncle Ted did. I mean, it, 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 that was in yeah. the 70s. But in, in this and, day, and it, 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 yeah. even more so. Right? That that was, um, I, I remember thinking of it at the time when, when I uh, heard that it had been published. And... Uh, uh, so I, I went to the uh, the central library in the city to to get the overseas newspaper, which was on microfiche, you know, and um, I had to search for bloody hours because I didn't know which edition it was going to be in. I think they said it was the New York Times or something like that. But even then, when he got it published, they double crossed him and they printed it in micro, like you virtually needed a magnifying glass to print it. It was all there, but. Uh, you know, they they, they double crossed him there. You know, they they, they uh, I think it was a toss up between the New York Times and one other newspaper uh, as to which one was going to, you know, allow themselves to be used by him. Um, but uh, I remember thinking that at the time, you know, like exactly what you said, that it would never have even got that far. You know, he needed to have done what he did, otherwise it it, it would never have escaped um, into. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, that was in in a while back. So anyway, you, you know, Uncle Ted's like a super genius. So if, if he thought that that was necessary to do what he did, I, I wouldn't second guess him on that. I think he's right. I told you the thing, the experience. I came and had an epiphany in, in Glendale in like 98 when, when I was doing the startup. And uh, I told you this incident. Where this this guy, you know, in in lun at lunchtime, in the middle of like the seven ten or whatever it is, the um, he immolated himself on the freeway, and so everybody, you know, went out for lunch and we couldn't get anywhere and stuff. And so we said, what the hell? And came back and people said, yeah, there's this guy who's just immolated himself on the freeway, 
and we switch on the TV and then they have a helicopter, you know, a news helicopter over the thing. And what he was protesting was Kaiser Permanentes would, you know, struck him off because he had AIDS. And so basically Kaiser Permanente, if you don't know, is a health, big health insurance company in America. And they, they were, if you get AIDS, you, you know, you're a liability for them. So they try to get, get you off they were, by some Weasley tactic, by saying it's a prior condition or something. And that's what they did to this guy. And so he was protesting AIDS patients um, being, you know, basically sentenced to death by health companies like Kaiser Permanente because, you know, <clears throat> because they had AIDS and, <clears throat> and were trying to get out of covering them. And, and so, you know, you know, that was his act of despair was to do, you know, insulate Britain on the in American freeway, um, put up all these banners. He put all these banners out and stuff about telling the story so you could see what it was. And then he immolated himself and it was all a big shock horror. Here's the thing. By the evening news, it made national headlines, right? By the evening news, they absolutely stripped every single frame that had Kaiser Permanente in every single story. They, no one mentioned he had AIDS and no one mentioned healthcare. By the evening news, it had been completely sanitized and it were, the whole story was nutcase, you know, burnt himself on the cemetery. And then, you know, of course, all the talking heads or, you know, the problem with psychiatry today and people are not taking their meds and, you know, all of this thing. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, my God, surely they don't have that much power. They do. Kings North yeah. hasn't even seen the beginning of this beast, right? They, they control the frame of reference in the media and that's their main power. Yeah, but I, I didn't know that's the detail of it. I mean, we're talking 1984 levels here. And so, you know, ba basically between the lunchtime live coverage and the, the evening news that everybody got to see, you know that a few phone calls were made. And, and uh, I, I doubt Kaiser Permanente even had to call up the news media. They, basically, all the guys are in place. They know the game. And no one will, no one will touch uh, a story like that. So they just... They want to report the story because otherwise, you know, they kind of seem to be suppressing it. But the way you do it is you just strip the content out of it. And again, it's the alien cortex defending itself, you know, basically there. Substitution. Substitution, mad nut uh, emulates himself on freeway for, you know, Kaiser Permanente is so bad this guy committed suicide in public to protest them. And so, so that's how the story. But when after I saw that, I saw like, okay. To get a message out about the machine, you can't even self-immolate yourself. So what what you know, insulate Britain are trying to do is hopeless. You know, you can't you can't sit in front of like the M25 and with a banner or something and stop the traffic and get get a message out. It's like yeah, I mean, you might get away with that in Britain because it's kind of parochial. But you saw how they twisted that message. You could never get you know if Faulty had a had a manifesto. No, no one from BBC to LBC, none of them would have read the manifesto. They would have, you know, just twisted it from the beginning. And so that's that's the territory we're in. So what what I'm building up to here is there's only one way to do this is to go Uncle Ted. And so I'm saying like we should go on Uncle Ted. Um, um, yeah, just, worth, uh, just... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, it might be worth a shot, um, you know, trying to, because there's a lot of these, like, programs now on Radio 4 where they're, like, they're looking at, you know, the sources of the disinformation and the, um, you know, and conspiracy theories. Like, there's plenty of programs like that that are being spouted out by the BBC all the time. Maybe fire it off to a few of those independent you know, journalists that, that produce these radio programs, just, you know, why not? Because um, they're often yeah. willing to talk. They did a whole series. They've done a whole series. They've got a series at the moment on BBC Radio 4 about the whole, um, uh, you know, the 6th of January, um, the storm of the of the Capitol building. Um, and they're, they're, they're endlessly, like, looking at, oh, why are people believing conspiracy theories and stuff? So, you know, there's got to be a few heads. In, I mean, BBC's huge, so 
worth a shot. Yeah, well, give it a go. Give it a go. But I, I rate you a 1% hit rate. So, so anyway, there, there were two <clears throat> things that I saw from Top Minds of Reddit. And one of them is, is kind of obvious that they believe anything in a white lab coat. So if, if you get professor or doctor or something like that, that, that then they will listen. If a, if a big professor or doctor says something, they will listen. And, um, and so it, based on that, then I, I did what, what I think A said on the thing was um, to go back to, to Guy McPherson. So I sent, I, I said, you know, oh, let's bygones be bygones uh, and sent an email to McPherson and stuff. But I, it was only yesterday I didn't hear back from him. So I'm not sure sure how that will go. But I thought... I thought, yeah, if he's if he's interested, and then you know, Professor McPherson is got is enough to make people look at it. But but again, there really is only one way to do this, and that's to go, Uncle Ted. So I'm not suggesting we do something like Uncle Ted, but you you've got to do something along those lines. And so the what what I'm suggesting then is you know what I I did actually lay it out. <laughs> Probably nobody heard it in the difficult section in the manifesto about acceleration. So I think basically you've got to use shock tactics, and so um, something that make people lose their mind. And the the the, the obvious one is to um, is to do something acceleration, um, and uh, you know basically be be seen to do it, and then you know that that'll be enough to to make people lose their shit I think. so do you want to find somebody who's close to the ice and <laughs> would start pouring well salt? i think oh, i think we should salt, target we should we should target we should target so they're basically two i said there's one in greenland and then there's the hkkh the hindu kush karavajan himalaya complex i think we should target that one the himalaya Okay, so either from the, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of countries around around here, but either from the Indian side or the Chinese side. And the kind of thing I'm talking about is, you know, you, you go and sprinkle some soot on, or try and make a, an avalanche or something, or you basically start uh, doing a line of research into how much damage you can do with soot to accelerate the melt of the, the Hindu Kush, and then basically publicize it, put videos, and then go go look for funding. Ask ask for funding to carry. It basically exactly the same thing that all the geoengineers are doing. You're saying we're doing ge geoengineering just like Bill Gates and all the heroes, Bill Gates and you know David Keith and Ken Caldera. They doing geoengineering completely. Um, unilaterally, without a mandate, without any democratic mandate, they are going ahead and doing all of this geoengineering. Why? Because they're rich. Well, two can play that game. Uh, we're going to do the opposite. They, they want to do sulfates in the air to try and save the civilization and trash nature. Well, we're trying to do accelerationism to basically try and save what's left of nature and, you know, precipitate the flipping so that we end this culture. And 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 you know, so it's exactly what they're doing. If they what they're doing is legal and stuff, it's like we can do this game too. And then basically, we hi that highlights geoengineering. It highlights you know these transhumanist nutcases that are trying to do geoengineering. And basically, it gets you know, if people are going to be horrified, presumably, and then they say like, say, read the manifesto. <laughs> it's all explained what we're doing in that. And then you, that's the way you get them to read. Well, it. Apart from contacting the the Nepalese or the Chinese authorities to to help us with that, it would be a bit difficult. But why not? Why not think along the lines too of of um, a cartoon or a movie or you know um, with with people doing this? I don't know. No, no, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. The first step is to get some people that will that will go ahead. I mean, even if it's just doing it. You know, going on Mechanical Turk. You can go on Mechanical Turk and get as many guys in India as you want <laughs> uh, for like five cents an hour, and um, you know, do something like that. You 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 do some incentive that like 
if you take uh, an amount of soot, you basically take it up, uh, show how you melted the ice, and we'll, we'll give you five cents per kilometer. Or so. um, you know, set up something something like that. And then basically you, you just have video proof that you've you've done it, and then we'll send you your money, something like that. You see, it's kind of like Bitcoin. It's a it's a Ponzi scheme, right? It basically, it's uh, the the more you know, get people on board, all all doing this for for a reward, or or otherwise, you know, just get some people to start it, just pay them, stuff like that. What do you think? I think I have to think. <laughs> I think it's good. We just need a lot of propaganda to go with it to promote it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm thinking just just use like Kickstarter and GoFundMe, and you just put all these sites around and say, "This is, you know, uh, this is what we're doing. We um, we accelerationists. We're trying to ac accelerate the ice melt. I like, don't mean stop that. So anyway, this is this is the same as. Is these guys like it's exactly the same as Leslie Fields and the Ice 911 guys? You know, they say it's called the the Arctic Ice Project. They changed the name, but I mean, we 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 could call it the Arctic 666 Project or whatever, and and just basically say we just you see what they did was they they went and put okay. If you don't know what the Ice 911 Project is, these freaking morons scientists want to put glass microspherules all over the the arctic ice okay um and basically to reflect the ice and to stop um, stop the blue ocean of it okay? um and so they did a test on a lake in minnesota where they put put these microspherules microspherules basically it's silica it's a it's a commercial product there's a little glass bead about you know very small about six microns and it has a hollow center so they float these things actually float. So they're basically talking about giving, you know, walruses and polar bears silicosis for the sake of the environment. And they, they said, oh, we did an environmental study. We got a, a tank full of sturgeon or something, and we chucked a handful of this in, and they were fine. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I think, like, windblown, you know, windblown microspherules in the Arctic is not quite the same thing as a fish tank with sturgeon in it, you Freaking morons! So anyway, the anyway they're not going to do it because. But anyway, they they funded right. They they were going to be funded by the freaking Stockholm Institute, the Stockholm University, and the the only reason why they're not going ahead with this insane project is because the indigenous people struck it down, and so indigenous and Sami people and they say you're not fucking doing this in the Arctic. But anyway, the whole thing was so freaking harebrained. I, I went on the 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 site where this uh, where they were discussing this and doing planning, and uh, they put up a YouTube video. And I said, "You do know um, that you know manufacturing glass for every ton of glass created, it's three tons of CO two is put up into the atmosphere." And she didn't know that. So it's like, holy shit, are you people stupid? You know, you need you'd need to cover just one percent of the Arctic. You'd you'd need about six thousand more glass factories than there are. You'd need six thousand times as many of the existing glass factories as there are to do this. So anyway, it's it's never going to be done. But it shows you how stupid these people are. But if in case you don't think they're stupid enough, and in case you're one of these libtards that says, listen to the science, who who are you? You know better than the experts. This is how fucking stupid these people are. This. It's not. It, you ask uh, ask somebody about how the ice is melting. It's melting because of the warm seawater is eroding it, right? It's melting because there's a wave action and because of the seawater. It's got nothing to do with the reflection of the ice, right? So, it's, so even the thing they they're basically going to put this bioaccumulation hazard in the Arctic, thinking that it's all that the Arctic ice is melting because. Um, the sunlight is doing it. It's not the sunlight. It's it's the warm ocean. So this is how stupid they are. And they're getting funding. They get funding from, you know, NIST and from from Stockholm University. And 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 these kids go, 
But we listen to the experts. We listen. To, this is how retarded these freaking fucks are. But anyway, so, all we're doing is showing so up and saying we, we, we're doing exactly what Leslie Fields is doing. It's just the opposite. She puts down these white spherules and we put down black thing. This is one for one. See, yin and yang. See, all works but, out. So, so instead of putting the, the suggesting to put some black salt on the ice, we, if we wanted to really go against the, the narrative and highlight the causes, we should, we should find a plan of, of heating up the water under the ice <laughs> and sending kind of <laughs> boiling no, water. No, the point is to precipitate the flip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But being the mechanism is it's not to go against the, the retarded idiots. It's, yeah. It's it's to precipitate the flipping. Yeah, to go yeah, against yeah. the retarded system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, practically speaking, um, am I right in thinking you're basically saying we incentivize, you know, we get like people in that area to track up into the Himalayas and actually distribute uh, coal or like coal dust or something black onto the. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just sounds fucking bonkers, but I mean, that's probably the point. But. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I do kind of get. It, but is that is that what is that it? Yeah. Is summary. Yeah. yeah. So, so the various ways to yeah. to spread um, uh, carbonates like this. So it's but it's basically it's it's soot. Yeah. It's um it it is sulfate. So you you can get a barrel of you can get a barrel of oil and just burn it in the vicinity, and it'll cover freaking hectares and hectares of snow in black. But uh, yeah, it's basically you gather soot, which there's plenty, plenty of soot in India, um, and you distribute the, the as thin as you can on the on the um, the ice, and and just so the, the idea is that it's experimental. You just do experiments to see what works best, and you just 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 start exactly like they're doing with the ice nine one one project. Ah, uh, okay, I see. Exactly I see. like they're doing with with the Scopex thing, you know, funded by Gates. You say like. He he wants to do his little atmospheric things all on his own, fucking illegal, but illegal in the states, and say we can do that too ourselves. And then um, yeah, so so then you know do it one for one. So yeah, we'll we'll consider stopping it when the machine stops. But like no no one's going to stop the machine, not voluntary, not involuntary, not not by Uncle Ted means. By Uncle Ted's never going to get his his anti tech revolution in. You know, in eight billion people, five hundred lone wolves could take the system down, but they're not there. <laughs> so, so onwards, you basically got to, you know, you got to wait for the the system to collapse from its internal, you know, intrinsically. Um, in in that, um... and, or otherwise, you 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 have to. Um, you know, otherwise the flipping is going to do it, or a comet. I can't see that any list is kind of running short after that that can stop this machine. Uh, towards the end of that video, the houseboat summit, <clears throat> uh, Alan Watts quoted uh, Robert Oppenheimer um, saying, um, uh, Robert Oppenheimer is reported to have uh, said quite recently, uh, that obviously the world is going to hell and the only way that it could be stopped was not to try to prevent it from happening. Um, yeah, but well, but this is accelerating it. So it's a, it's going to hell. Yeah. And you see, well, Michael Mann and all of these guys, they keep on spreading this misinformation saying, you know, there's too, it's time for human agency. There's still, it's not like we're powerless. It's like, dude, we passed all the tipping points. I mean, the, Go and have a look at the paper side in the manifesto. The tipping point happened in Greenland 20 years ago. The, 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 you know, the, uh, I was always taught in our school that the Amazon is the lungs of the world. That's what they always used to say. Well, it just so happened that in 2020, the lungs started uh, being a net carbon source rather than a carbon sink. So it's like, okay, they're tipped. The coral reefs have tipped. The, the Arctic ice, you know, you ask Torsten, is it like it tipped in the 70s? So it's like, what is Michael Mann talking about? He never talks, you know, say like, well, we could stop carbon. 
you could yeah we could you know stop emitting carbon and is there like yeah but we could the alcoholic could stop drinking but is it gonna stop drinking you know no everybody knows michael mann included that this alcoholic is going to drink himself to death so, so the the <clears throat> there is agency but it's uh it, it uh, this only agency to to push it along not not to wind it back yeah we're in the position of somebody that's just caused an avalanche so you know you you can why are they wrong is that they come up with all these stories saying you know we can we had the we had the intelligence to make this crisis. Therefore, we have the intelligence to get us out of this crisis. It's like bullshit. You you had the intelligence to drive off a cliff. Now you have the intelligence to drive back on again. You're talking crap. So it's like they have all you know all these. They talk like it's a real stat. Like we dialed it up. We can dial it down. And no, the Earth is a fragile, chaotic system. We just tipped it into a chaotic mode that doesn't include our species. So it's like, stop talking crap and start, you know. But, but it, just like uh, a kid that's just started an avalanche, you can throw a pebble and start an avalanche. It doesn't mean that you can stop the avalanche once, <laughs> just because you could start it. it, doesn't mean you can stop it. But you can always throw another stone and make the avalanche bigger. That's where we do have agency. So, yeah, we have the agency to make it worse. We can always do that. And so that's that's what we you have to do basically. If the only only destination for this is it's it, you know if the only way out of this dysfunctional family is the alcoholic father drinks himself to death, then clearly everyone, including the alcoholic, is better off the sooner that moment happens. So apply alcohol. Put bottles of whiskey in front of this alcoholic. And just say, you know, you decided that's how it's going to be. Drink yourself to death, asshole, and make it quick. Here's some alcohol. So everything works. You can, you can, go, you can go and burn fossil fuels. That helps. Great. So we, we have the oil industry on our side. We can even go and ask them for funding. So we have the best excuse to burn oil to the last drop. But this is the thing, Hugh. Uh, my, my comment is uh, that, that, you know, supposing you could, you, this, this could be done. Um, I still get the impression that what what the enterprise that the, that the human race is on right now is still going to be the fastest way to achieve the result. It's already happening. Everybody's already doing it. Uh, I mean, it's just ramping up you, you, well, no, all of the, the graphs. That... Here, here's the problem. is Every day that this, this, this machine runs, right, is it adds another 220,000 people. So it's 100 million every nine months are added to this equation. So a lot of people say, I'm not going to damage nature. You know, people would die if you'd be an accelerationist. Say, okay, if, if you're worried about people dying horribly, well, make a, make a flipping happen now because every delay you adds 100 million people who are born in front of this demo. So it's like if you get to 10 billion 11 billion we'll be at 11 billion people by 2050 so it's like you can save 3 billion people from suffering and dying by just making it come early so every every day and you know an extra i put the the amount of hectares i can't remember what it is now but it's it's thousands and thousands of hectares are deforested every single day it's the net deforestation and there, there's like there's 40 megatons of CO2 is put up every single day. So it's like the, every single day, the chances that there are any survivors on the other side of this collapse are going down and they're going down exponentially. So, so you can't sit and wait and say, oh, well, let's be Zen about it. And you know, life and yin and yang and stuff, that's suicide. It's basically, if, if you, you, you can't be complacent because you-, you, you No, no, I, you don't, I don't mean it that way. Survivors. I didn't mean it that way. I, you know, I just meant that the the the, the degree 
the, the rate at which humanity is running amok, uh, it's probably going to get there before any, any ac actions to accelerate the matter have any effect. I mean, it, it just strikes me that we're, we're really pushing it. Yeah, but to read the uh, manifesto, we were talking about an Uncle Ted moment, and that is also a purpose yeah. for the manifesto to be highlighted. It's not just... Oh, yes, yes, you know? yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, no, our aim is not to... Yeah, it's not to actually... I, I, we do, we're running a PSYOP, right? We're not... Look, this is one of the problems with, uh, with Uncle Ted, is, is that if you look at something like, um, say, in World War II... So, in World War II, in the imagination of you know English people in particular, you know we did the bombing campaign, and Bomber Harris wasn't a complete war criminal and stuff. And it's like what they never told the British people is, it, is you know they showed all these afterwards. They were very careful to fly low over Germany and show how devastating it was and stuff. And the reason was they wanted to make you think that the bombing campaign was hugely successful and it wasn't a war crime. It was a war crime. Trust me. John Bomber Harris and the fire, deliberate firestorm in Dresden, the bombing of Lubeck and stuff. These are war crimes, dude. These are weapons of mass destruction. That We're talking like, you know, hundreds of miles an hour winds that are thousands of degrees Celsius on civilians. And they did it deliberately. So it's like, here's the thing that Britons don't know. The bombing campaign only reduced Germany's manufacturing capacity by about 20%. So in other words, it was ineffective. It, it didn't actually cripple Germany. Right? So, that, so they don't want you to know that little detail. But what Here's something that will surprise you, though. My teacher told me that at school. He said it was a war crime and it wasn't as effective. So that will surprise you. But he was a bloody good teacher. So that was a bit of a, bit of a well, rarity. I bet you he's not teaching anymore. Yeah, I bet I you he's got early retirement. Uh, another thing, too, in America is, you know, we're taught that, oh, nuking Japan was what got them to surrender when that wasn't the case. Um, I've read some things where the planners that nuked, that planned to nuke Japan, screwed them on their um, surrender negotiations and nuked them to flex their muscle at the Soviet Union. Yeah, there, there was an Australian and a New Zealand team that, that exposed all that, and they said... They, they they showed all the papers where the the uh, the emissary or whatever is it like gave unconditional surrender. They always said no. They offered surrender, but not unconditional. We had to have unconditional. And they said like they offered unconditional surrender before the atomic bomb. And then the, the all the communiques going back to Tokyo are saying like, why won't they accept it? And they said we don't know. He said like yeah. we offered. He said well, what more can we give other than unconditional surrender? And they said. I don't know. We we completely flummoxed, and then yeah, they saw the atomic and, bomb, and they said, "Oh, now we understand. It's a big revenge attack." And yeah, and, and yeah, and that resulted in a bunch of dead civilians, like those British bombing runs in Germany. Yeah, but then they were bombing and destroying Japan cities with just normal aircraft, too. So, yeah, they they almost got three bombs on them. But anyway, the 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 point is that. Um, the, that if you had a, a, a you know an anti-tech revolution like that, and so if you had enough ecotage, um, you, you, well, maybe these days it's kind of brittle with an EMP, and you could use cyber warfare and stuff like that. But but that's going to happen anyway. We're heading into war, and you can see in the Ukraine they've been having you know cyber attacks and that by Russia. But I, I, bit, can I just um, as you were talking about ecotage, I remember that you suggested that that could be one of the the subject of the conversation uh, questions we'll have with Sue on Tuesday. And I just wanted to remind everybody that at 9 uh, a.m. UTC, we're talking with a rep of DGR uh, Ireland. And uh, yeah, uh, it will uh, it will be posted on Reddit. Are you you're going to post it? Hugh, I think. Hugh. Yeah, I forgot to post it yesterday. Thanks. For yeah, yeah. Me. Maybe we should do yeah. it today because she's going to be. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah so that today, many yeah. people will, will see it today. It would be better. Because I don't yeah, know. Okay. She, she hasn't read the manifesto. I haven't sent her any of um, our stuff to read before. So I was wondering, because we're talking about this, should we leave that on the back burner first? Because 
it might be a little bit heavy to arrive with the manifesto when you know there's been a lot of of uh, of no, things. No, I thought so. I was. I yeah. wasn't. No, I wasn't. I, wasn't I don't think we can bring that up. But if you yeah. have any suggestions of, uh, I, I've written to her to say that we'll. The questions will be uh, anti-tech revolution and, and ecotage, the place of ecotage. And, um, you know, I sent her the, the thing that you sent me in an email on, on the, the last uh, writings of Uncle Ted. But other than that, if you have any ideas of anything I can send her before about us. Um, that's I didn't, I didn't, hmm? No, that's fine. No. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so this is this. This is the thing: is that, uh, that you see, I I put this manifesto together. I mean, I said before, because people were starting to accuse me of um, being logically inconsistent with the, the stick that I was pointing, and I, I I I was, but hopefully now in the manifesto everything is straightened out. But here's the problem: if you if you transhumanist. Right. If you want to manage everything, you want to de do geoengineering, the progressive narrative, um, it's, it's Darwinian and you, you inexorably wind up in eugenics. So you, if you manage everything, even down to the weather, you have to manage the human population too. You have to manage the feeble-minded. You have to manage you know, everything down to the genes. And so in, an, in a total management system, you, you have to accept eugenics. There's no... There's no get out. So, so that's their, that's the albatross around their neck. The albatross around our neck, all the tree huggers and team human, is if you absolutely convinced that this machine cannot be reformed and, um, and cannot be stopped, it really leads you to accelerationism. You, if you want to save this, since you can't reform the machine, this the only way to save the environment is basically to accelerate the destruction of the machine. And so all these guys, like even DGR and stuff, this you know, it's, it's written in in everybody. It's written in Extinction Rebellion and IB and all of these guys. It's like saying if you talk to these guys, if you talk to Blondie and Faulty and stuff. I was surprised. I thought there was some issue with the, the you know, point of contention that like, we don't have any time for this. It's, and they admit it straight out. They're complete doomers. They just don't say it in public. So everybody is a total doomer. And so what they're doing is logically inconsistent. They're basically doing campaigns for the government to do green initiatives and say, why? Why are you doing this? And they're basically, well, the hidden agenda is like global revolution. But uh, they know the system's not going to reform, and you say that, you know, but Fulton and Blondie said to me, is like, say, yeah, we know, we're fucked. We're absolutely fucked. Humanity's fucked. There's, the chances of us not going extinct in the near term is close to zero. Is they like, well, what's all this other shit? You see, there's a, they have this logical disconnect. But, yeah, so we all fucked. It's just so they can feel better. Harder. It's like, Why? It's just so they can feel better, isn't it? So that they have something to say, you know, just to polish their ego. Well, I did my best. I did something for this. But I don't want to do that because then I'll end up in, you know, a torture cell or something. <clears throat> Here, um, is this any, uh, uh, a kind of an extension or another manifestation of not being able to make the leap, the kind of spiritual quantum leap? Um, you know, where, the, where that can't be done from the normal mind into the, uh, you know, the fourth bull drawing. Similarly with, with, with mm -hmm. Faulty and, and Co, that they can only go as far as this, but they can't make a, a, a kind of a leap from what they're doing to what really has to be done. It's a disconnect for them to do that. So there's a parallel yeah, situation. Was, yeah. That's what I was going to say. That, that see that um, it's what we were talking about earlier. Is is like they can see the machine outside, but they can't see the machine inside. And so the very concept, you see, what the great success of liberalism and the atomization that the machine has achieved of us all is that um, 
is that everybody's so individualistic that they can't even imagine self-transformation. I mean, self-transformation means a lifestyle change. It means, oh, I'm spiritual. I'm into this. I'm into that. It's, everything is superficial and ephemeral. Right? An absolutely transformational experience like you go through, uh, you know, like you psychosis or a ayahuasca trip or something like that is, is, no, I'm not in the market for that. Is that like we're not talking about marketing? There's, they're not a, they're not a million roads to travel here. There's, there's just this one hard fucking highway that is is total transformation, and it's not some game or something you just meditate or smell this and stop and smell the roses and stuff. It's it's psychosis. You, one way or another, you're going to go through psychosis, right? We're going we're going through mass formation, mass psychosis, right? It's not. Yeah, all these guys are in denial about it. We, we're in the beginning of mass psychosis. So everybody is going to go through psychosis individually, collectively. Psychosis is on the cards. You are not going to go through this, the flippening, the collapse of this, this machine without psychosis. So it's like the only question is what kind of psychosis? Well, there are two types. There's a good one and a bad one. But you see, we've been so fucked over by, you know, modern psychiatry and psychology and stuff that we don't even know that. It's kind of even transpersonal therapists and stuff start going, you know, to a higher power and into religious and shit like that. It's like Jung told you that there are two psychoses, like, you know. So it's like, oh, we didn't, we, we looked at that. But anyway, yeah, but let's just keep this transpersonal and impersonal. Why not? And transsexual, why not just cut our nuts off instead of actually go through a, a mental transformation? We'll bodily transform. Why not do augmented reality? We'll we'll get you know a silicon implant and we'll augment our hu humanity. That'll be that'll be our transformation. We'll transform into cyborgs. Anything other than transform the fucking demon, <laughs> the fucking demon inside. So, yeah, so we, we don't even I'll... have the fucking language to do it. And so, yeah, yeah, sure, these guys go and rage against the machine, join Extinction Rebellion, and say, what about the inside? Well, well, I'm a vegan. What do you mean? I'm, I'm woke. What, what, come on. I mean, I need to change. It's like I've already cut my nuts off. I've already changed genders. Is that not, you know, come on. What do you want of me? It's like some real change. <laughs> yeah, yeah all that. Die, asshole. Ego's got to die. Yeah, all that all that crazy shit, like looking back and on my time in the military, like they did me a big fucking favor <laughs> for sure. They did like at the time I hated it and I was miserable, but reflecting like back on that, like that experience like gave me something that most other people don't haven't seen. Like they can get there too, but yeah, you gotta you gotta rough it. <laughs> but uh, here, this is an important point. You see, all these little darlings haven't seen a haven't seen you know the state in action the state puts you in a meat grinder there are far too many people there are far too many unemployed people unemployed people get used up in the trenches that's the traditional way they handle the excess population right you little darlings that are so into your democracy and so into your little personal lifestyle issues and first world problems you little darlings are excess population right so it's easy to predict where you're going you're going into a draft you're going into the iranian front or somewhere in a proxy war like in the ukraine or something like that. the draft is coming listen up little kids the draft is coming now when you get drafted they're going to put you through the military training that db and i are telling you about that's not transformation they're transforming you into a unit in a military organization that's going to be in a meat grinder war. So that's not a, so you'll be transformed. You'll be transformed into a soldier um, that's basically an army ant that's going to be gobbled up. So it's like that's another one of the transformations that are substitute for, you know, legitimate transformation. So you, you can't be a conscientious objector or something like that. You, you've got to go through all of these. These are all part of the ordeal. You have to you have to be drafted into the military. You have to, and, and you have to like like Blackadder is a good example. You have to make it through the system that way.
anyway. So a lot of people in America have been through the military and stuff. So this is more for like English people and Australians that haven't hadn't haven't had a draft since like Vietnam. And so it's like you know we've had a couple of generations that don't know the story. Other generations were well familiar with it. I'm not sure they could do a draft in the UK anymore. I don't know if it's still in law that they could do that. Do you think no, it no, is? No, no, in... it doesn't work that way anymore. So, 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 okay, maybe I wasn't playing. So, in the old days, that's how it worked. Now they go; they've refined all of these things. How they do a draft is that they basically they uh, they make sure all the kids have are unemployed, and then they they make sure the only way you can get employment is if you go and join some outfit like Blackwater or something like that. So you. you 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 will wind up as a military contractor, and it's basically there are no other options but you go and sign up for a, a for-profit uh, soldier for hire. That, that's how they're going to do a draft. They, they, you see, they they no it's it's not the horse and cart anymore. They no longer declare war, right? They no longer declare war. They no longer do a draft. They they have more subtle ways of doing exactly the same right. But you can fill the military easily by just. Um, you know, taking away the doll. It's easy. So you'll, you'll lose the NHS, you'll lose the doll. If you, if you want medical, if, you've, if you're young and able and you want to eat, it's basically you'll have to go and join a private contractor company or join the military. Well, uh, well, yeah, you know, okay. that, you, you know what that reminds me of? Have you guys seen that movie Starship Troopers where the only way you can get citizenship is if you join the military? <laughs> Yeah, really it's, dystopian. It's the, it's the same in America. It's basically the America's population is actually on the decline, but it'll grow to 400 million by uh, 2050. And the reason is immigration. So they're just they're using immigrants, and they will use immigrants basically. For the armies will be stocked up by immigrants. That's also traditional. So yeah. Anyway, well, I guess it's just going on a long time, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Just to say on that point, um, one thing they have been doing in this country is basically, you're right, yeah, NHS is you know, dead now, basically, almost. Um, but they're, they're recruiting, you know, like former retired doctors and nurses and also just volunteers to do the jab. So in some respects, that's a kind of, you know, a volunteer for people who haven't got anything else to do or they're unemployed. Um, come and help us here, you know. So they're on the front lines of the the virus you know worst place to be is the hospital if you don't want to get it yeah army work by a graduation thing so it's like they, they can draft you into a civil defense unit and they can draft you into and then as the war gets worse and worse the civil defense unit suddenly finds itself at the front and you go like hey i'm granddad's army and say well yeah but like sorry the soviet side berlin and granddad's army is the last defense so up you go <laughs> So basically, the, the machine will eat down to the bone, right? It's just how badly the war goes. So if the war goes well for you, um, you know, granddad's army is not going to be drafted to the front line. And, but uh, uh, it'll take the prime of the youth. And, uh, yeah, basically, they're all going to be gassed and, and see, a, you know, white flashes of either phosphor or atomic radiation in, in the Middle East. But the... the, the um, uh, you know, all the way down the line, um, the the machine was. Uh, you know, if you if you're winning, yeah, you you get the benefit of uh, overlords. Um, but uh, we're not going to win. We're going to do very badly on our side because you know we we have to have a blitzkrieg, and I can't see the blitzkrieg coming through. So it's like, if if uh, if the axis of evil, you know, doesn't win in three weeks, they're finished. But the the that finish will be uh, years. So, so, the, so, you know, China, Russia, Iran, the North Korea—they all have—they have to drag out the war, and I think it'll be pretty easy for them to do. So, so yeah, and then that dragging out of the war is the bits that I'm talking about now. They'll try. They'll try and do it with technology, right? They primarily technocrats. So they they want to do a, a blitzkrieg with technology. As I explained to you, technology and battlefields go together like a Swiss watch in a mud trench, you know. So it's like, you know, 
technology is useful for a few hours <laughs> in a military setting and then increasingly becomes less and less useful and then you get back to the, you know, the weapons the previous war had and so you know that's that's going to be quite a quick process and and then uh, you know then we we straight in 1984 is be like good news citizens victory on the iranian front and then basically but now the african front is <laughs> turning to shit <laughs> You, we'll get there, man. It, it's it's not literature. It's it's prophecy. Yeah, in the 1984 though, wasn't like the three or two dictatorial super states like colluding with each other to manufacture these wars, so none of them would totally have a, a outright victory. That was like yeah. the craziest part of it. Yeah. Yeah, but what what do you think they're doing now? You think they're playing with the red hats against the the blue hats in America and stuff? Yeah, no, it's a there? yeah, it's a one once one world government now because of the financial system, right? Yeah. You just I mean, okay, here's the King's North, the the bottom of the iceberg that King's North has only just seen the tip of and is completely horrified. Is go and have a look at the bankers. Since since the seven years war, they sat on both sides. You see Go and have a look at who Xi talks to, who Putin talks to, who, who Biden talks to. They're the same guys. Jesus yeah. Christ, man. Yeah, it's like in that uh, that one rock song I linked a long time ago where they were talking about the bankers and they said the vampires feed off of the wars of mankind. War is a business opportunity. It's a big one. So it's like, you know, yeah. It's like the other one is is you know, the bioweapons and and the healthcare industry. It's like, yep, they just this is how the machine eats itself. It's cannibalizing itself, and this is you know, each one of these things on on the witness. Another one is religion. So just don't don't run there. <laughs> yeah, but that's again where where he's not looking at the machine uh, internally, he, and that's where. Uh, my big reservation about his essay, which is well written. I mean, his uh, the the V moment. It's it's well written, but it's it's this it it um it's a dead end because it's just uh, portraying an external um, a horror which we are talking about. But he's not going any further. He stopped. He stopped there. Yeah, I, but I mean, that's why I say that if he's listening to this, my advice is to stop writing because it's it's holding him back. He's 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 uh he's second guessing he's 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 trying to you know get to all these conspiracy theories but he's really guarded he doesn't want anybody to think he's a kook and stuff and it's like you got to move faster than that you know you you can't you know have your psychological evolution go at the pace of the general public but the general public is they're going to be taken down with the side right so so you're at the back of the pack king's north and part of the stuff holding you back is your narcissistic writing. It's like ditch it and start moving your thinking on. That's my advice to St. Paul. Get off the fucking cross. <laughs> Things about to get real, dude. <laughs> so, okay, well, on that happy note, <laughs> should we end it? Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, but anyway, we've done a good stretch. All right, so let, let's let's give this all up, and hopefully this is recorded. <laughs> Better technicians than me. Yes, it is. It is. Sorry about that. I feel like it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's it wasn't your fault. It's it's the machine. It's the I'm amazed the machine let us get this much. Uh, this much yeah, that was spooky. Information spooky. across on its backbone. <laughs> Okay, well, let's pause. Let's uh, okay, and, and let's just give up everything we talked about here. This complete renunciation, capitulation to whatever happens, but not defeat. So it's a question of give up and fight, not give up the fight, and not give up and die. It's give up and fight, and this is the part where we give up 
and we connect to the silence and the silence gives us the strength to fight. Om Paramatma Nirmana Ji. All right. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hugh. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. See you later. Bye. Be safe.